He was terribly late. Zhang Yiwan raced as fast as he could, almost panting, feeling the blood throbbing in his temples and the cool air in his throat. His dark hair was messy, but there was no time to smooth it out. On ordinary days, he strolled quietly not far from the streetcar lines, listening to the hectic rhythm of the huge city, and frankly sympathizing with everyone who was always late, in a hurry, and did not notice the charms of the world around them. But today, Yvonne could only sympathize with himself. Running without the slightest respite darkened his eyes. He wanted to stop, or to continue running on automatic, because he was so tired. But the young man thought that if he stopped, not even the impending tsunami would move him. If they happened in Moscow, of course. To calm his chaotic thoughts, the young man began to summarize his monthly budget in his mind. The result was depressing, but not so depressing that every day Ivan was like a grim survival. His life was different from that of those who were quite tight. He wasn't starving, though he hadn't felt truly satiated in a long time. He had a place to live, even if he had to pull out a stack of prickly and frankly unpleasant blankets at night to cover himself. It was warm enough. Sometimes, in some strange way, there was still some money left over at the end of the month. Yvonne didn't spend it, didn't have fun, like many of his peers, but saved it for the future. No one knows how the sun will rise tomorrow. Yvonne shook his hand on the run so that the cuff of his shirt would slip so that he could see the face of his wristwatch but it didn't move an inch, even though it was always trying to reveal his pale, narrow wrists. In fact, sometimes Yvonne's shirt behaved scandalously. For some reason it often came out of his pants and showed off a strip of skin. Probably because Yvonne often took off and rushed off somewhere. Cursing, he picked up the suitcase vigorously, holding it with his pinky and ring fingers to glance swiftly at the time. Cursing through his teeth, he sped up even faster, though it seemed much faster. Only a couple of blocks to go, Yvonne thought, struggling to catch his breath. Optimism had always been his forte, as his mother had once said, even if that forte often malfunctioned. Suddenly, a frosty wind blew right into my face, burning my skin. The young man's cheeks and nose turned even redder. It became unbearably painful to breathe in. He was knocked off his rhythm and even blown a little backward, and the next moment the cold and fatigue came over him with such force that Yvonne wanted to just collapse on the spot. But he was expected, so he just couldn't let down the man who had almost trusted him with his life. In the shifting swirl of identical gray houses, a tall, statuesque figure of a man suddenly appeared out of nowhere. He was walking relaxed on the sidewalk, talking on the phone right in front of the speeding Chong Yaiwan. The young man realized with some inner obviousness that he could not slow down, it was clear even without superpowers. He saw, as if in slow motion, the man unfolding, the way the flaps of his coat fluttered, and the previously calm eyes with a slight chuckle lazily widened. As soon as the collision occurred, Yvonne's torso was thrown back, as if he had hit a wall, not a person. Just for a second he thought he was going to fly away from that walls and his soft spot will meet the hard and dirty asphalt. And he had only recently bought that suit. Ack. But suddenly warm arms wrapped around his waist and pulled him back. There was a high, almost girlish squeak. Only Yvonne would never admit that he'd made it. The stranger's reflexes were admirable, as if he only had to catch clumsy passers-by like this every day. Yvonne was out of breath and his nose pressed against the soft fur of the man's coat. The sudden jolt made him dizzy, and the firm grip on his waist with someone else's hands made him let almost all the air out of his lungs. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yvonne managed to say it without even stuttering, and raised his head. And then he froze with his whole body. The monumental figure in front of him was both fascinating and frightening at the same time. The man was a very tall man so even the not-so-tiny Yvonne had to tilt his head back to get a good look at his savior. For some reason he thought the stranger's hard, clenched mouth was about to quiver in a condescending smile and say, You're mistaken, though the man certainly looked like a god. Yvonne thought he definitely hit his head hard. The first thing that caught his eye was the sculpted god's platinum blonde hair. 
It was as if tiny crystals had become entangled in them and were now shimmering in the winter sun. Yvonne couldn't tear his gaze away from the captivating play of light, and somewhere in the back of his mind he felt that the piercing wind had somehow become soft and gentle. He hastened to pull himself together and lower his gaze. He stared into those appealing gray-blue eyes. Yvonne held his breath involuntarily as he saw the deity's scalding coldness in his gaze, and he felt uncomfortable. While Yvonne tensely wondered why he associated this phenomenal passerby with a wolf, the man spoke, Are you okay? Oh, no, it's okay. Yvonne finally came to his senses and began to move hastily away. What's on your mind? Deity Wolf. His vis a vis grinned briefly and relaxed his arms. He stood flooded with sunlight and seemed to shine like a jewel in a frame of expensive fur from the hide of a predatory beast. Under his coat with a sheet fur collar he wore an elegant black suit, which wonderfully emphasized the strong figure and masculine forms of its owner. Compared to Yvonne, dressed in an ordinary cheap suit, the man was incredibly handsome. It was as if he was overwhelmingly attractive, hypnotizing. What's a man like that doing in a not-so-well-to-do neighborhood? Suddenly his lips curved into a broad smile. You could even make out the sharp, snow-white fangs. Yvonne looked away. Sorry about that. He spluttered his hands as if to say, Well, here's to all that. Nothing. The man answered calmly and looked at Yvonne more attentively, more interested, smiling all the while. He jerked his shoulder involuntarily as if trying to shake it off. I was looking down at myself with a piercing stare, but it didn't work. It became unbearably awkward and uncomfortable. Then I guess I'll be going. He was about to sneak out and continue on his way, because, hey, he was still late, but the stranger suddenly called out to Yvonne, wait a minute. Yvonne turned too sharply and squinted against the sunlight shining in his eyes. Why don't you wear sunglasses? Yvonne blinked stiffly. No, he'd heard, of course, that the sunlight reflecting off the snow was stronger than the ultraviolet rays of the summer sun. And more dangerous. This is especially true in Russia, where most of the year is dominated by winter. But how can you be so tactless to point this out, when he himself walks around without glasses? Besides, aren't lighter eyes more susceptible to the sun than darker ones? Yvonne often had to fend off blatantly rude questions from the Russians. Sometimes it seemed to him to be part and parcel of their souls, to pry where they were not asked. He smiled nervously and twisted on the heels of his shoes, raising his hand and peering at the dial on his wrist. The sunlight reflected off the glass, so he covered the watch with his hand. Oh shit, he was monstrously late. Yvonne broke off abruptly, almost slipping and blatantly ignored the attentive and appraising stare at his back. Suddenly the phone rang. The ringing went on for a couple of seconds, and then stopped after a second, ringing again. A blonde man in a smart coat grinned at his thoughts and answered the phone. Yes, Dimitri. There was just a little accident. No, nothing like that. He laughed and moved in the same direction as Yvonne, who was already out of sight. The north wind seemed about to blow the ramshackle house down. It was old, old, with cracks in the walls. After a hundred years, it could barely withstand even the weakest of snowstorms, let alone private winter storms with gale-force winds. The windows literally shook with the sneezes or coughs of their aged owners, as if they were about to break into splinters. But no matter what, the structure weathered the storm stubbornly year after year. Or maybe it was the reverent attitude toward the house as a living creature. He hugged the old woman gently, suppressing the urge to hug her tightly, and kissed her snow-white hair. Yvonne smiled as he heard the usual disgruntled grunt. I'm sorry, I was a little late. Nothing happened while I was gone? What could possibly go wrong? Dinner is ready, go wash up. Grandma said. Yvonne mumbled softly in agreement and let his grandmother out of his arms. It smells really good. How was your day? That case you were in such a hurry to get to, how was it? Yvonne usually handled cases of ordinary people, no power and no money. So he almost always lost such cases, or his fees and compensation were pennies. 
people simply had nothing to pay him. This time seemed exactly the same to him and did not portend anything special. Nicholas came by. Grandma said. Nikolai was their third-floor neighbor. A sad fate befell him the factory he had just bought had been completely brazenly and illegally transferred to an official. Most recently he had asked Yvonne for help, and he had sincerely promised to think about it. He too often took cases without learning the details, but for some reason this time he asked for time to think. I'll go up to him after dinner. Tomorrow I'll go to Zhidanov's office and try to talk to him personally. Yvonne concluded. Grandmother nodded as if accepting that answer, not daring to dig any deeper. Yvonne walked into his room, which was also his office, and immediately pulled on his tie, untying it. It was cold and chilly outside, and after today's adventures he was sweating. The cold, hot fluctuations didn't bode well. He felt uncomfortable, so he briskly undressed, throwing his clothes on a chair, and quickly pulled on an old warm-knit sweater. The pants at home took a little longer. Yvonne rubbed his forearms to warm himself. Deftly and habitually, he adjusted the jacket and pants, hung the suit in the creaky closet, and went to bed. The engine roared in the dark alley. The sound echoed among the old mansions and rushed on, down narrow streets and alleys, not getting any quieter than a decibel. The bellow was accompanied by desperate sobs and wheezes, one after the other, getting louder and louder. The last of the strength that the victim had thought a second ago would be enough to escape was gone, irrevocably. In an alleyway, spreading the deafening echo of the engine's roar, stood an ominous black car. The man in the back leaned back slowly and casually, enjoying the familiar smell of expensive leather and a cigar. The man glanced fleetingly at the shadows outside the window and pushed the window elevator button, leaving a small gap to see who had disturbed him. Everything is ready. Yuri Caesar Alexandrovich Sergei briefly began. He is the head of the Sergei organization, one of the most dangerous and influential criminal clans in Russia. In the dark world he is nicknamed the Tsar. The Tsar put the almost completely decayed piece of his cigar into the ashtray and leaned back relaxed on his seat. And he said those who talk a lot do not live long. Even though these words referred to the murdered informer, they echoed in Yuri's heart with great fear. He nodded briefly in agreement, kneading his frozen hands. Caesar looked boredly out the window and, raising his palm, tapped lazily on the glass with his knuckles. The driver, who had been listening to the conversation the whole time so as not to miss the moment, immediately started the car and, when it moved, lifted the partition, turning the interior into a perfect secret room. What about the Zhidanov case? Yuri had been waiting for this question for a long time. He cleared his throat and uttered the answer he had prepared hundreds of times in his head. Everything is going smoothly. As expected, they show resistance, but in any case it won't be long now. It lasts longer than I expected. After the terse reply of the Tsar, the subordinate became nervous and, already stammering, uttered I'm very, very sorry but due to unforeseen circumstances the process has been slowed down. But very soon everything will be ready, the result will not disappoint you. Nikolai may be holding on to this venture, but in any case, what do you mean by unforeseen circumstances? Lawyer Yuri said. The play of light and shadows accentuated the clear lines of the face, which made Caesar's expression seem quite predatory and dissatisfied. Lawyer then? The mayor's office— located in a brand new building in the center of the city, looked posh and pompous. The location alone spoke volumes about its owner's influence. On this day, the building was filled with barely audible whispers related to the unexpected visitor. Do you think everything will go smoothly? Yuri said there wouldn't be any problems. When Zhidanov asked the question in his ingratiating tone, Caesar only took his cigar out of his mouth and lazily exhaled a thick smoke completely ignoring the question. Jadonov, confident that if he had crossed the line in the conversation, he would already be dead, continued, Alexander has known me for a long time. I always keep my promises. We'll be sure to give you the case, so please take care of the plant business. Caesar still wasn't paying attention to him. Jadonov impatiently babbled, King, I need your answer. Say something. 
The man finally deigned to look at the mayor and took a deep drag, smoking his cigar all the way out. Caesar exhaled the tart smoke and poked the butt into the ashtray without taking his keen eyes off Shadonath. I'm a busy man, Shadonath. You spent so much time calling me and asking to see me, and in the end all I hear is whining. Shadonath forgot for a second who he was standing in front of, and was about to answer and put the arrogant boy in his place. But to the mayor's delight Caesar interrupted him. If it wasn't a good deal for me, or if it wasn't a good deal— I wouldn't have taken the case in the first place. So why should I waste my time on your worthless questions now? I beg your pardon, King. But I have to interrupt you. A guy calling himself a lawyer is trying to get in here. What do you want me to do? Caesar slowly lit a new cigar and clenched it between his teeth, nonchalantly asking, Lawyer? It was Lawyer John Lee One. Sorry for the intrusion. You're not kicking me out, are you? It looks like you're busy but I have some very important documents to give you. It seems that I interrupted your meeting. Suddenly it was as if he stumbled on a phrase and stopped talking. A long streak of sunlight illuminated the figure of a man who stood in elegance. His platinum blonde hair played with hues in this gentle natural light. A man in a dark gray pinstripe suit stood with his arms crossed. His gray eyes were cold which made the brunette feel as if hundreds of icy needles were piercing his entire body. Yvonne recognized him. Of course, he clearly remembered this. Master of life. Who in his right mind would dare forget such a man? The air was literally frozen by this man's powerful aura, but Yvonne, swallowing hard and salivating, found the strength to speak first. Forgive the impoliteness. Here are the documents. As I said, there hasn't been an official response yet, so I'm going to proceed on my end. All the relevant documents are also attached, so please review them when you have time. Yvonne handed the envelope of papers to Jadonov with a sense of satisfaction, enjoying the way his face naturally twisted. In spite of the stare that continued to study the brunette, he smiled boldly, which provoked Jadonov even more. Is the little lawyer playing games with me? He couldn't contain his anger, and his teeth gnashed with every word he uttered. And even to such blatant intimidation, Yvonne responded calmly, Well, that's fine. Since you're so experienced, I, some lawyer, won't have to explain to you that the factory case will soon be over. Veins appeared on Jadonov's forehead. Chan decided to end the dialogue with Jadonov and turned away. The blonde man, who was still smoking a cigar, caught his eye again. All this time Caesar had been watching him carefully. Yvonne immediately felt that piercing stare, and it tingled his skin more and more. He had no choice but to pretend to ignore him completely and to be interested only in Jadonov. Chan could have simply ignored him and walked away but he became desperately curious and willingly approached the man to talk. Hello, my name is John Yvonne. Lawyer. He purposely turned on his working tone and pulled out a business card from his inner suit pocket and held it out. Yvonne wondered who exactly this man was who sat so confidently in Jadonov's office. He did not seem at all disturbed by the sudden intrusion of the lawyer. Call me Caesar. At first Yvonne thought the man was a foreigner. However, when he accepted the business card handed to him and took a closer look, he realized that he was definitely a Russian. Yvonne thought he would go on and say something else, but that was it. Caesar continued smoking his cigar again, looking at Yvonne through the smoke. Chan simply walked out without forgetting about decorum, having first said goodbye to Zhidanev who was frozen with rage. The quiet sound of the door closing echoed through the office. A shriek from an official cut through the silence. Cheeky son of a bitch. How dare he? Jadonov exploded with gut-wrenching anger and threw away the envelope that Yvonne handed him. He turned to Caesar, literally drooling with rage. Look at that bastard. How dare he challenge me? We should have dealt with him sooner. 
Damn it, did you even hear him, Caesar? If we leave it as it is, he'll ruin everything for sure. He hesitated, because he suddenly called the man by his first name, but he didn't seem to care at all. Jadanov's shouting was no more than an irritant to him. Yvonne exited the office and headed for the restroom at the end of the hall. It was no different from the rest of the building. It was just as clean, luxurious, and equipped with the latest plumbing. He turned on the cold water, rolled up his sleeves, and washed his face. After splashing water in his face a couple more times, he felt himself coming to his senses. After a brief sigh, he finally reached for some paper towels to wipe himself off. A chill pierced his brain and a creeping feeling ran through his body. Yvonne hastily wiped his pale face and frowned. It's not going to be easy. So, I'm not going to drag it out. The case turned out to be more complicated than I had anticipated. Jadanov had a trump card up his sleeve. Trump? Nikolai asked, before he could even touch the tea, kindly extended by Yvonne. I'm afraid Jadanov won't give up so easily. Of course, I did not initially hope for a compromise, but I am afraid he is not going to pay even minimal compensation. What are you talking about? Who? What? Nikolai gibbered nervously. Mafia? Yvonne nodded slowly at his question, holding his breath. He took out the business card he had received from Caesar and showed it to him. Nicholas literally stopped breathing when he saw the inscription on the thin card, printed in gold leaf. Yvonne felt ashamed and sad. Victory in this battle has been retold in advance. Nicholas would lose everything. This is a gift from Zhidanev. Yuri pulled out a small rectangular object. Caesar irritably untied the string wrapped around the box. Inside was a limited edition fountain pen from a well-known company that had been on sale just days before. Yuri's jaw practically dropped to the floor in shock, and he quickly shifted his gaze from Caesar to the pen and back again. This is just what you were looking for. And how could he have guessed it? Chdanov must have found out from someone that Caesar collected fountain pens. Yuri shuddered. Embarrassment swept over him. I thought I mentioned that I hate it when people talk too much. Caesar said in a low voice as he opened the cap of his pen and exposed his pen. Yuri bowed his head apologetically. I thought there was nothing wrong with it. I'll be careful from now on. Caesar was silent. Yuri continued to watch him from a distance and still carefully spoke up. He said it was just a gift as a beginning of cooperation. The main one he will pass on after the case is over. You don't like it? No, I like it, the blonde replied calmly. Suddenly there was a knock on the door, then it swung open and a security guard rushed in. Excuse me, Zar, there's someone here to see you. He says he has an appointment. What was his name? We need to check the Tsar's schedule. I think he did contact us, but he's not on the schedule. Says he's here about Jadanov. He's a lawyer for someone named Nikolai. Says he's here to see Caesar. Tell him I'm not here. Caesar waved his hand, interrupting him. I have nothing to say to him, and I'm not going to listen. Tell him he can do anything he wants. It won't make a difference. What should I do? Yuri asked. Give it back. Caesar ignored the assistant's question and clicked on the pen case. The men turned in surprise to the door, which swung open abruptly. Yuri immediately reached for his gun, but his eyes widened as soon as he saw who had entered. It looks like you're busy, Caesar. The surprisingly beautiful smile on the lawyer's attractive face was unconsciously charming. There was silence in the spacious office. Yvonne opened his mouth, but first he corrected his suit, which was somewhat shabby from the scuffle. Forgive my rudeness. He smiled even brighter. I'm a very busy man, too, so I can't always find the time. 
I had no choice but to come straight to you. I called ahead, but you kept lying, so I figured it was worth talking openly. Caesar looked at his smile appreciatively, without uttering a word. Yvonne fixed his tie, then ran his long fingers through his hair, trying to arrange it. He kept trying to tidy himself up casually, which made him unbearably attractive. Your influence on the counselor is obvious. Remember that I am Nicholas's lawyer, don't you? Proclaimed Yvonne. Caesar, turning away in his chair, smoking a cigar, as if he did not notice Yvonne and said not really. John Yaiwan was surprised at such an answer. How could he not remember such a vivid encounter and said what? We crossed paths with you in Jadonov's office. To which Caesar, shaking off the ash from his cigar, smirked and replied, No, I don't remember. Yvonne was unhappy with his answer and decided to remind him of their meeting. He grabbed a pen from Caesar's desk, jumped on the desk, ducked as close to Caesar as possible, and stuck the pen in the paneling of the chair, saying, Now you will definitely remember. Caesar was surprised by such actions of Yvonne. At one point he even liked it and replied, I will definitely remember. Jumping down from the table, Yvonne fixed his disheveled hair, adjusted his suit, which was in a somewhat shabby state, and continued, I will not repeat myself and ask if you are mixed up in Jadonov's machinations. But keep in mind, dishonest advisors are often arrested, and their associates are inevitably caught up in the investigation. Yvonne threw several folders on the table with the words, Here are the documents. I advise you to weigh all the benefits and risks for your organization. Contact me within four days. As he left, Yvonne said goodbye to Caesar and slammed the door. Caesar continued to sit in his chair in bewilderment. Not taking his eyes off the door, he pulled the knob from the chair paneling. Yuri panicked, not knowing what to expect from Caesar, nervously asked. King, are you all right? Caesar held the pen in his hands with the words, Well, now there's no way to get the pen back. In anger, he threw it across the room. Find all the information you can about him. Family, homeland, where he studied, even the number of books he brought. I've been wanting to get a pet tiger for a long time. Caesar decided to visit his cousin Dimitri. Entering the club, Dimitri surprisingly greeted Caesar with the words, Well, finally, come on in, brother. Dimitri is Caesar's cousin and childhood friend, a former FSB officer who now owns the club. You're right on time. Are you in some kind of trouble? said Dimitri, holding out his hand to Caesar. He shook his hand and kissed him on the cheek. Caesar pushed Dimitri away. He didn't like his insistence. What are you doing? As a child, you asked me to do it yourself, Dimitri said in puzzlement. It was a long time ago, said Caesar, and sat down at the table with appetizers and expensive alcohol. Dimitri sat down opposite Caesar. He was surrounded by several beautiful girls. Be easier, brother, softer or something. Maybe people will be attracted to you, Dimitri said, flirting with the girls. He continued to flirt with the girls, not paying attention to Caesar, and said, So, tell me, how's it going over there? Caesar squeezed out a phrase. Like butter. Dimitri realized that Caesar did not want to talk in front of strangers. He waved his hand, thus showing the girls that they should leave. When the girls left, Dimitri asked about the documents of the Zhidanev case. Did you see them? Do you still intend to continue? Caesar took a glass of whiskey, drank a little, and said, Of course. To which Dimitri continued, If those bloodhounds find even a speck of dust, everything will be over. Caesar leaned back on the sofa and said, Do you think I'm afraid of someone like Jadonov? Dimitri leaned back on the table, put his hand to his head, and sighed thinking that Caesar didn't know what he was talking about because he didn't want any problems. Think about it, what good would it do? Wouldn't it be better to get it over with? 
said Dimitri. Caesar needed bait to tame the tiger. A tiger? Dimitri asked in bewilderment. Caesar got up from the table after finishing his whiskey and, as if he had not heard this question, asked if he knew that Mikhail Lamanosov was ill. Without waiting for an answer from Dimitri, he went to his room. Dimitri got a headache and was surrounded by the girls and the manager. The manager said that Caesar had gone to his room and had ten people ready for him, as Dimitri had ordered. One of the girls asked Dimitri if it was true that Caesar could handle ten people in one night. To which Dimitri replied, Yes, the man is an even bigger beast than he seems at first glance. Let's see how fast it ends this time. The cold that had been raging for some time was gone. Li Wan, who woke up at the same time as usual, got out of bed, feeling lighter in the warm weather than at other times. Today he was going to deal with a personal matter after a long break. He looked at the note in his hand. It's been seven years. Li Wan suddenly remembered that day, and his eyes hurt. Li Wan, can you even find one person? His mother's face flashed in his mind as she helplessly stroked his cheek. You can definitely find her. Li Wan clenched his fist slightly and paced more powerfully. Li Wan walked briskly to the address indicated in the note. After walking alone for some time along a quiet country road, he finally reached his destination. He knocked softly on the door, and after a short time came the answer. Who are you? The sound of footsteps followed the old man's voice, which flinched slightly. On the other side of the threshold, Li Wan saw the face of an elderly man covered in wrinkles. Hello? My name is Li Wan Yung. I'm a lawyer. Li Wan pulled out his business card and held it out to the man, who looked at him languidly, as if passing him by. I came here because I wanted to ask you something. Maybe you know a Korean woman who lived in this house about thirty years ago? Her name is Su Young Jong. The old man, who had been blinking blankly before, suddenly looked surprised after a few seconds of pause. At that, Li Wan's heart began to pound furiously. It was not until late in the evening that Li Wan returned with shaky steps and no strength. The old man remembered his mother, but no more than that. She was a real and beautiful woman from Korea. Of course, it was difficult to find a trace of her because she had left the village long ago, but he promised to find out and took Li Wan's hand firmly. In any case, for now he had no choice but to wait for a call from the old man. He doesn't have the energy to do anything else today. He wanted to wash up and go to bed. Something was left on the floor under the door. There was nothing suspicious in the envelope. Apparently someone had slipped it through a crack in the door. Li Wan examined what was inside the thin envelope with a bitter sigh and suddenly frowned. Inside was just one ticket for the evening show. What the hell is this? Li Wan then discovered a thin business card inside the envelope and soon realized the situation. Caesars. The theater as grand as its ancient history, was crowded with people who had come to see the performance. Casting a quick glance down the corridor, Li Wan immediately found this man. His figure, sitting cross-legged on a couch to one side and reading a pamphlet, stood out strongly. However, the man's movements, whose only action was to slowly flip through the pages, were so cold that they made him sigh. The perfectly tailored dark brown suit that fit his body was simple. Wasting no time, Li Wan approached him. When he stopped right in front of him, the hand of the man who was slowly turning the pages also stopped. Li Wan sighed, looking at his golden hair shining in the light of the inner light. Now answer me, he said. At that moment the bell rang, heralding the beginning of the performance. When Li Wan involuntarily turned his head to look at Caesar, he opened his mouth, looking out at the concert hall. It's about to start. Let's go. What? The unexpected words surprised him. 
Caesar, however, did not panic in the slightest, holding the folded pamphlet in one hand and Li Wan's hand in the other. Li Wan, who was suddenly grabbed by the arm, stopped, but Caesar did not hesitate to lead him. Li Wan spoke hurriedly as he was suddenly dragged along. Wait, I'm only here to get an answer. I'm not going to watch the play. I'll give you an answer when we watch the play, Caesar said. At these words, Li Wan paused. Caesar asked Li Wan, who looked at him confused. The answer will be today. There are still five hours to go. Don't you have any patience? The tone of his voice barely changed, but Li Wan suddenly realized that he was laughing at him. If you thought he would be nervous and hysterical, you were wrong. Li Wan answered him with a defiant look. I hate wasting time. It's amazing to call Giselle a waste of time. It is a classic ballet dance, especially famous in Russia. Caesar looked at Li Wan. And how are you going to do it? The bell rang again, and just before the door closed, two men entered. The performance of the Russian Ballet Company, which is the pride of Russia, was taking the soul out of him. He could not concentrate on the stage because he was impatient to see what answer the man sitting next to him would give. Li Wan was determined and focused. At this point Caesar stood up. When Li Wan, blinking with bewilderment, looked at him, Caesar looked at him, too, and smiled slightly. Shall we eat together? Ah? A shocked exclamation arose on its own. Li Wan whose expression immediately changed, jumped up and looked at him. Do you really think I'm going to have dinner with you in peace now? Caesar opened his mouth, shouting furiously. Well, don't you? Li Wan, on the other hand, ignored the question as strange and turned away. Son of a bitch, I should have stuck a fountain pen in his neck, he thought. Unable to contain his growing anger, his steps became violent on their own. Li Wan hurriedly left the concert hall with jerky steps. Caesar looked at his back and smiled strangely, but made no attempt to catch up with him. He felt as if his body was glued to the mattress. Li Wan made a sound of pain and slowly turned around. He had made a mistake. He blamed himself again and again, but the headache wouldn't go away. It was caused by excessive consumption of cheap alcohol. He was still moaning from the headache that kept pounding on his head, but suddenly there was a loud bang outside. The strong sound instantly awakened Li Wan from his sleep. Li Wan, who had been sleeping soundly, opened his eyes and lay down for a while. Guys, what are you doing? Can't you guys stop? Along with the old lady's shout, Li Wan didn't hesitate any longer and jumped out of bed. Grandma, what's going on? Li Wan, who was hurriedly running down the stairs, stopped screaming. The scene that unfolded before his eyes was real chaos. As soon as he saw the cafe scene, broken and in disrepair, he briefly froze. Grandma, what the? Li Wan quickly ran up and stood in front of Grandma to protect her. Immediately he was punched in the face with his fist. The bandits reminded Li Wan that they had asked him to be quiet and mind his own business. Nicholas, who had also been wounded, lay unconscious on the floor. The bandits kept trashing everything around them and saying that if they didn't get it right, they would have to explain it in a bad way. As soon as the bandit took a swing, Li Wan didn't get confused and hit him first. When Li Wan calmed down after the showdown with the bandits, he heard his grandmother bending over and saying something. The bandits broke the porcelain teapot his grandmother had inherited from her husband. Li Wan tried to figure out who could have arranged all this, but no one but Caesar came to mind. Li Wan thought that Caesar was clearly demonstrating yesterday's denial. The sweet aroma of tea permeated the office. Like most Russians, Caesar loved tea. In particular, a cup of tea in the morning was important enough to affect his mood throughout the day. Caesar put it succinctly. Ludmila is always good at it. 
Thanks to this, everyone in the office was able to start their morning in peace. Caesar looked at Li Wan, as if to offer him a drink, but he didn't move. He just stared at Caesar with a stiff expression that was not much different than usual, except that his eyes burned intensely. It was strange because he threatened the secretary and attacked him without warning. Although he usually wore an expensive and elegant suit, he looked very different today. His crumpled shirt hung over his dirty pants. His coat was carelessly draped and unbuttoned, and he wasn't even wearing a hat, a must-have item for going out. In addition, the back of his head was very unkempt, as if he had not looked in a mirror, and it looked as if he had just woken up from an earthquake. Thinking about it, Caesar suddenly noticed a bloody fist and large bruise on Li Wan's handsome face and frowned slightly. Did you get into a fight on the way here? Li Wan looked at him with a surprised expression on his face. Caesar once more enjoyed the taste of the gradually cooling tea and then set the cup aside. Can't you even afford a cup of tea in the morning? asked Caesar, turning away from Li Wan's untouched cup. I didn't come here to talk to you about tea. I already know enough about the mafia to do anything to help Jadonif, Li Wan said in a stern tone, staring at Caesar. But the fact that they even attacked my grandmother, who had nothing to do with it, is serious. Thanks to you, I am more determined. This is a case I definitely won't lose, Li Wan grinned. Let's see who wins in the end. Li Wan challenged Caesar. Caesar was speechless. He just stared at Li Wan with an expressionless face. After a while Caesar asked, Attack? At one word that came out so easily, it was useless. Li Wan lifted his chin and asked provocatively, Are you asking because you don't know? Caesar frowned instead of answering. What the hell is this guy talking about? You keep coming to me and saying things that completely contradict each other, and then asking me why I don't know. Caesar, who had a more noble attitude toward the mob than Li Wan, spoke only after Li Wan had fallen silent. Did you dream something? I wonder if you had a strange dream last night and came here to make a scene. It's awkward to barge in and say things you shouldn't say. In fact, it's different from the mob. That's what a noble lawyer should be, Caesar said sarcastically in a casual tone, narrowing his eyes. Can you win? Caesar's mockery proved effective, as the one's anger immediately erupted. In a moment of loss of self-control, Li Wan picked up the cup of tea that he had not touched and poured it on Caesar, who looked at him mockingly. The black tea was poured on Caesar quite deliberately. As soon as Caesar got up from his chair, he avoided Li Wan's attack and grabbed his arm, not his waist, and pulled him away. Ow! Li Wan shrieked as he was thrown onto the couch. Caesar bent his arm from behind and pinned it resting his other hand on the couch, and opened his mouth. You have quite a temper. Let go of me, you bastard. Coward! shouted Li Wan from under Caesar's grip. Do what you want. Violence and intimidation is all you can do. Li Wan replied furiously. As soon as you woke up, you ran over here. Li Wan stopped at the unexpected words. Caesar lifted his hand from the couch and gently stroked Li Wan's hair, which was sticking out to the sides. Your clothes are the same as yesterday, and your body smells like alcohol. It looks like you've had a lot to drink. Never mind. Caesar continued, ignoring Li Wan's cries, to shake his body again. When you wake up, the strongest body odor comes from the man. It's your scent, Caesar whispered burying his nose in Li Wan's hair. Caesar's breathing sounded especially loud in the quiet office. The man's body felt so real through his back. Even though he was wearing a thick coat, Li Wan felt Caesar's whole body so hard. Caesar's hand reached down and tucked the cheap coat between them. The man's body touched Li Wang's body, 
and he realized how thin his pants were. The sensation of touching his buttocks left no doubt. Caesar, checking the scent through his hair, pressed his lips to Lee One's ear. He whispered, Spread your legs. After all that had happened, Caesar said, Shall we get back to the point? Coffee is a disaster? Li Wen watched as he painstakingly lit a cigarette cut with a cutter, feeling annoyed and embarrassed at the same time. You would know better. And why do you think that? Caesar asked, bringing the cigar to his mouth. Li Wen immediately she looked up from him terrifyingly at him. Of course, because you are taking care of Senator Zhidanov. Li Wen, who was speaking, paused for a moment. Suddenly he a strange idea occurred to me. Isn't this guy? Does your face hurt like this? He closed his mouth at the words he asked before Li Wen. Even if. I will not say that it is not a medal from a proud fight, but that I fell out of bed and hurt myself. You did not do it. Instead of answering, Caesar narrowed his eyes at the question he asked suspiciously. Well, what do you think? I thought, of course, that there must be a reason to come and put together a scandal at a time like this. It is not. Of course, there was a reason. There's no reason to come and shake now. But he felt a little out of place. Be honest. Have you? Caesar let out a long puff of smoke that he had inhaled deeply. When Lee Wan inadvertently frowned at the pungent smell of the cigarette, Caesar gasped. If that's me, what are you going to do next? Of course I will sue. Caesar asked Lee Wan, who responded immediately. Evidence? When Li Wan stopped, Caesar continued to speak calmly. You know better than I do that if you doubt someone prematurely, you're guilty of innocence, right? When Li Wan, embarrassed, could not find nothing to say, Caesar smiled silently and put the cigar in his mouth. If you were a lawyer and you had entered without evidence, of course, you would have lost the case. Li Wan bit his lip. He was angry, but I couldn't help but admit it. It was a clean defeat. The problem. It was that he lost his temper by letting himself get carried away by anger, which is rare. Excuse me? Li Wan, who had just returned to his usual form, straightened his back and opened his mouth in an extremely calm voice. Okay. Next time, I'll come to you with evidence. Then, after saying goodbye, Li Wan turned around. Mr. Lawyer. Li Wan, who was about to leave the office as he was, was called out by Caesar. Reluctantly looking back, Caesar, who was sitting at the desk, asked, I was talking about it earlier. I wonder if that's not the case, Lee Wan thought, but unfortunately it was. When you get lynched, the eardrum ruptures and the cornea falls off, it's just the beginning. There are cases where they just die, Caesar said calmly, as if it was someone else's business. As if not, there would be nothing like a person dying before his eyes. Of course it was someone else's business. Does anyone in the world dare to lynch that man? Caesar's last suggestion. Choose. Would you be blind or would you spread your legs? Li Wan returned the question as he was. If I were you, would you be eaten by a hungry lion or would you be tied up and buried alive? Caesar paused and unexpectedly burst out laughing. When Li Wan blinked at the unexpected reaction, Caesar said with a smile on his face, It's hard, I can't try because I only have one life. Li Wan nonchalantly added as if he knew he would. If you choose, I will answer you. With those words, Li Wan immediately turned around and left the office without looking back. When he had no choice but to look back to close the door, Caesar, who had been watching him until then, slightly raised a hand to wave goodbye. Czar. Confirming that Li Wan was leaving, Yuri hurriedly entered the office and looked around in a hurry. Are you okay? Do you have a problem? Why the hell is that lawyer boy he always comes to visit you in such a hurry? Caesar's voice interrupted Yurik, who spoke hurriedly. When Yurik closed his mouth, Caesar silently gave the order plus. Look behind Jadonif, what he is doing. Yes? Senator Jadonif? Ignoring the surprise Yurik, Caesar took a deep breath. Restoring the cafe was quite a challenge. After two full days of eating and cleaning, Li Wan decided to buy the materials himself and make the table and chairs. 
Grandma's frustration didn't last long. The winter in Russia was harsh enough to simply crush the desire for interior design. In Russia, where the north wind has been blowing for more than a year and a half, Lee's advice one was quite effective. In the end, Lee Won promised to make new furniture whenever his grandmother needed it, and then agreed to make a wooden table and chairs. It was a repetition of the same routine every day. During the day, she helped rebuild the cafe and prepared a test with Nikolai from afternoon to night. Currently, the only way left was to report the injustice of the situation through a lawsuit. There was little chance of win, but Lee Won decided that she would never give up until the end. With a crash, the old door opened and someone entered. Although the business was closed, the villagers came and went from time to time, so Lee Won raised his head without much thought and then stopped. Of course, his unique hair was enough to tell who he was. Caesar. After him entered the store. Long time not see you. To Caesar who greeted him briefly, Lee Won glared at him instead of greeting him face to face. What's happening? Caesar kept talking without reacting to his defiant look. I have something to give you. You will probably want to have it. Then, Li Wan turned his gaze to the briefcase he was holding. The envelope quite thick it was hermetically sealed so that you couldn't see inside. Caesar opened his mouth as he looked at him suspiciously, with a reluctant face. Are you on trial against Jadanif? Therefore? Li Wan angrily urged the next words. However, Caesar showed no signs of hurrying, just relaxed. It would be difficult if the councilman was the opponent. Also, I have connections with high-ranking officials. Tell me what's going on. Evidence, don't you need it? Like a fisherman casting bait, Li Wan stopped at the enticing voice. Caesar spoke in a relaxed tone. Evidence remains of all the corruption. We cling to the weaknesses of the other for fear that the other will betray us. Caesar lifted the briefcase lightly. That's exactly what you use it for. Li Wan's expression changed. Is Jadanov's corruption hidden in that envelope? The next question was why the man was doing exactly what Li Wan wanted. With amamentary expression of longing on his face, Caesar remembered a faint smile as if he knew he would. If you want, change your clothes and come down in twenty minutes, because it's hard with that outfit. Caesar looked at the dusty old jeans and shirt Li Wan was wearing, Caesar said. Reservation time is running out. Booking? Let's have dinner together and talk. Li Wan immediately frowned, but Caesar's reaction didn't change. He looked at his wrist watch. Nineteen minutes left. How can I trust you? He didn't use the same trick twice. Caesar, who had simply dismissed Li Wan's suspicions, tilted his head. Isn't this necessary? Watching him shake thick papers in front of his eyes, Li Wan bit his lip. Caesar added Li Wan, who turned around with a swear word. You curse me, so I'll cut it down to ten minutes. Damn, don't be ridiculous. Who likes? Five minutes. Exactly five minutes later, Li Wan, who managed to get into the car that started the engine, headed to a big restaurant in the city. Enjoy. Cooking is also an art. Unfortunately, sports cars are useless in Russia. Occasionally it snows and strong winds blow, but it's very difficult without a roof. But I keep buying it. Even expanding the garage for a car I don't travel in. Okay, come on, give me the envelope. As I had felt before, he was a man who tested patience. During lunch, Caesar didn't even mention the newspapers. The wine was just the beginning. After moving from talking about football to talking about heritage and the writer who recently won the Nobel Prize, Li Wan clutched the corner of the napkin and barely resisted the urge to swing a knife at Caesar. His eyes continued to wander around Caesar. Where the hell did you put it? Li Wan, who has reached the peak of his patience, decided not to put up with Caesar anymore if he brought up a new topic and put it off. Dessert. At the same time, Li Wan jumped out of the spot. The napkin in his lap fell to the floor, but he ignored it. To Caesar, who stopped talking and looked at him, Li Wan spoke to him in a cold voice. If you don't give me the papers, there's no point in spending time with you, the employee who. 
He was there, and he walked over immediately and handed Caesar an envelope. As Li Wen stopped and looked at it, Caesar took the envelope in one hand and looked at it. Here it is. It's not free. Are the tortures he has experienced so far not enough? When Li Wen raised his eyebrows and looked at him, Caesar said, If you kiss me, I'll give it to you. During the busiest hours of the night, the famous restaurant was packed with diners and staff. There were also many people who looked at the two of them in a strange atmosphere. What I can do? Caesar narrowed his eyes. Li Wen did not hesitate. Standing with the table in the middle, Li Wen leaned back and pressed his lips against Caesar's lips. He wanted to touch Caesar's well-groomed lips with his soft, elastic lips, and then press them together. Involuntarily, Caesar closed his eyes. When a sigh came out, the hand Li Wen grabbed the envelope Caesar was holding as if he was snatching it away from her. And the kiss is over. After leaving a brief greeting, he immediately turned around and walked out of the restaurant. A smile slowly appeared on Caesar's lips, who was calmly looking at Li Wen's back. You are also funny. A smile that was more satisfied than ever remained on his face as he calmly exhaled. My God, you are amazing! As soon as he left the court after the trial, Nikolai shouted with excitement. For him, who was even contemplating suicide with the foreboding of utter defeat, today's trial was very close to a miracle. Li Wen smiled and warned him not to calm down, but a complicated feeling remained inside of him. The documents that Caesar gave him were amazing. Nikolai nodded firmly with a face. Yes, it was a lot of work. I need to go tell my wife. Thank you, thank you very much. Li Wen, who had sighed involuntarily, suddenly felt his look and raised his head. He did not know how to bring this matter to an end. Suddenly, an image of Caesar appeared in his head, who offers to take an envelope with all the evidence. At this moment, Li Wen shook his head, he wanted to get rid of the image in his head. But still, the only option to complete the case was Caesar, who can provide all the evidence. Knock sound Caesar raised his head at the sound of the blow. Ludmilla entered with an expression she uncomfortable and informed. You have a visitor. Hello, brother. It was Dimitri. He walked over to Caesar, who was just looking at him without saying a word, and smiled as usual. It's a disappointment. Who are you waiting for? Caesar only gasped. What's wrong? No call. Did I ever call you? Sitting calmly on a long sofa, Dimitri he looked at Caesar. Dimitri always came to the office like this, confident that he was special to Caesar. He always made Caesar's face scowl, but he was never punished. But today was different. Make an appointment from now on, because I'm busy. If you are not here, I can play with Ludmilla. Then make an appointment with Ludmilla. Caesar continued speaking nonchalantly. I have a date from now on. What? The schedule should have been empty today. Caesar immediately went back to the phone. I told you not to eavesdrop. To the calm voice, Dimitri answered naturally. Stalking you is the joy of my life. Caesar stood up without saying anything else. Taking heart from him, he put on the suit jacket which he hung up silently. You are leaving me? Even if a boy older than 1.90 pretends to be cute, he doesn't work. Caesar quietly stroked Dimitri's head with one hand and left the office. Dimitri shrugged, ruffling his tousled hair, but he didn't follow. A slight smile appeared on his lips as he looked at the watch on his wrist. It's time to feed the hungry tiger. When he barely finished the court session and walked out, Nikolai's face darkened, to the point of turning almost gray. It was evident that he was tired from the endless battle. You must not give up now. I did not tell you from the beginning. The trial is the most important, who lasts longer. You're suffering a lot because of me. I'm sorry. Li Wan, who unintentionally looked around, witnessed an unexpected sight. A sedan was parked on the side of the road. Li Wan soon say he turned his attention to Nikolai and spoke. I need to figure something out. Nikolai nodded without answering. Li Wen, who shared a light hug with a bitter smile, moved into the sedan. The smell of cigarettes, with which I have now become familiar pretty, floated in the car. 
Looking to the side, he took the long cigar that Caesar burned and spoke. You look pretty tired. It's a long fight. It was when he sighed involuntarily as he sank deep into the sedan's leather seat, which was more comfortable than his own bed. I have a request for you. When Li Wen rolled his eyes and looked to the side, Caesar looked at him with thin eyes. The fee is high. I don't do mob work. Caesar blinked, pretending to be surprised by the answer that came from immediately without thinking for a moment. Isn't it just rejection without even thinking about it? Li Wen looked ahead. Anyway, I don't. Caesar brought the cigar to his mouth. Red flames rise from the slowly inhaled cigar. Slowly exhaling the hazy smoke, Caesar spoke again. The trial seems to drag on. A smoke filled with smoke went through the car. Caesar said, You want a test that can be finished once and for all, don't you? Li Wen raised his eyebrows suspiciously. Caesar turned and looked at him. It's been a rifle until now, but this time it's a bazooka. Caesar, deliberately sulking, continued to speak slowly. If you accept my quest, you can also get it. Li Wen didn't speak easily this time. He just looked at Caesar with a suspicious frown. Li Wen bit his lip. He didn't want to lie. Based on experience so far, the bazooka that Caesar speaks of cannot be compared with the evidence so far. It was clear that it would become a litmus test that could win the trial at once. But Li Wen just kept his mouth shut, Caesar said, calmly bringing the cigar to his mouth. Aren't you going to kiss me goodbye today? Li Wen warned him with an expressionless face, as he looked forward with his arms spread wide. Don't climb. With a cold voice, he immediately turned around and got out of the car. Suddenly, I heard a laugh from behind. Li Wen took out a note and tried to throw it away, but the car had already run away. Li Wen furrowed his eyebrows and looked at the rear of the car that was driving away. He still had a wrinkled note in his hand. He could have knocked it to the ground, but he hesitated for some reason even as he thought about it. After standing there for a while, Li Wen finally put it back in his pocket and walked towards the house with a more complex feeling than ever. As the phone rang, it was a call from Nikolai. He answered the phone with the feeling of a kind of bad feeling. Nikolai's voice was as urgent as crying. Before Li Wen could even ask why, he yelled at him. The factory is closed. In an instant, Li Wen's body stiffened and said, I'll go now. Li Wen hurriedly walked up to him, seeing him scream and fall. Nikolai was hit in the face from the front, spilling nosebleeds, and found himself unable to get to his feet. Li Wen immediately protested. What is this? The man who punched Nikolai looked at Li Wen, and instead of explaining it to him, he also tried to punch him, barely resisting the fist that he was about to leave immediately. Li Wen avoided his body. No matter how you look at them, the men didn't look like gangsters. First, it was important to understand the situation. Bastard, what do you think? He yelled in a high-pitched voice at the man who was about to push Li Wen again by spitting out abusive language. I'm a lawyer, Mr. Nikolai. What is this now? Who the hell are you? Said the man clearly showing the expression of him who had just gotten angry. It's the mayor's order. Close the factory. Belatedly, Li Wen realized that they were city officials. Representative Zhidanov would have no right to do that. Isn't it clearly illegal to arbitrarily shut down a factory while it's still being prosecuted? I'm going to call the police. I don't know, this is an order. Now are you okay? Come on, turn it off. The man yelled as he passed the crumpled papers to Li Wen. Reluctantly, Li Wen's face twitched as he took a step back and hurriedly looked at the documents. On, um, how are you? Why, what does it say? Is that document true? To Nikolai's hasty question without hesitation, Li Wen replied with a pale face. Yes. The voice came out harshly, as if trapped in the vocal cords. It is real. One who barely found a business card in the pile of files, he pressed the button. I agree to your offer. He could feel Caesar chuckling silently. Without dragging it too far, he said. I'll send the car home tomorrow. Li Wan looked at his cell phone and let out a shaky breath. The election is over. 
Now only the action remains. Welcome, Li Wan politely greeted, raising his head. The size of the mansion was unimaginable. As Li Wan turned, the butler took the lead and guided him. Men in black suits stood on either side of Li Wan, silently following him to the front door, their gazes shifting. The hall resembled a greenhouse, with walls and a ceiling made entirely of glass, allowing Buk Gu's precious sunlight to flood in. The furniture consisted of comfortable yet outdated sofas, tables, and a clock. Caesar, who led Li Wan into another room, sat down and broke the silence. Did you encounter any trouble on your way? Li Wan replied. Not really. Caesar smiled and brought the tea to his mouth. Before Li Wan asked if it was his house, Caesar responded with a relaxed expression. Do you like it? Li Wan answered honestly. Heating will cost a lot. Caesar blinked and inquired with a curious face, as if suppressing laughter. Can't you afford it? Li Wan asked. What am I going to do? Caesar extended his hand toward the humidor and casually mentioned. It's just a minor struggle for ownership. As Caesar spoke, he reached for a cigar. Li Wan frowned, but Caesar continued unperturbed, searching for his cigar. Li Wan firmly grasped Caesar's wrist, his outstretched hand demonstrating proper etiquette. It is good manners to make eye contact when someone speaks to you. Caesar remained silent, standing in front of Li Wan. Li Wan could feel the strength in his clenched hand, holding on to the man's strong bones. With a faint smile, Li Wan released his grip. I meant the market. Then Li Wan replied, The mayor's actions were questionable. When Li Wan casually turned his gaze toward Caesar, the latter smiled faintly. People are destined to die in one way or another, Caesar said, resting his arms comfortably on the back of the couch. There are no children, no family, no one else. All that remains is vast real estate and cash. Li Wan immediately grasped the nature of the request. So would you like to have it? Caesar asked. Is there any reason not to? Li Wan acknowledged. If I don't take it, someone else will. Though he didn't like it, it was true. Rumors circulated about a powerful mafia controlling the market's wealth. It was easy to imagine a war among the mafia for such a substantial inheritance. Li Wan inquired again. So, what does this have to do with my test? Caesar replied. There is no direct connection, but corruption is never committed alone. Caesar glanced at his empty hands and then back at the humidor, shrugging. Flies always swarm together. Suddenly, the pieces clicked in Li Wan's mind. He raised his eyebrows and spoke slowly. The mayor has been involved in corruption with Senator Jadonov. Instead of responding, Caesar posed a question. Do you now understand why you must take this job? Li Wan wore a serious expression as he silently pondered. Indeed, it made sense. Exposing Jadonov's corruption through a dispute on this side alone would be a massive blow. Utilizing the media effectively could result in the removal of Jadonov from parliament and even imprisonment. It would then be possible to win Nikolai's trial. Li Wan was convinced. Corruption is always the weak point. The alliance of corrupt politicians would eventually backfire on them. Caesar, observing Li Wan's reaction, smiled to himself and remarked, Did my tiger capture its prey? Li Wan frowned, wondering about the sudden comment, but Caesar said nothing. Let me guide you to the room. Caesar finally said, Room? Surprised by the unexpected words, Li Wan quickly intervened. I have no intention of staying here. Send the materials to my house, and I will review them and contact you. Caesar displayed a surprised expression, but Li Wan immediately saw through the act. Are you joking? If I bring everything to my small house, I'll have to sleep in the hallway. In that case, I will come to your house. Please leave the data with me. Caesar repeated Li Wan's words. Li Wan nodded calmly and added, I will commute daily. Caesar spoke again, narrowing his eyes. I won't be able to pick you up every day. Li Wan maintained an impassive expression and replied, That's fine. I'll take the train. For a moment, Caesar exerted a strange pressure. I apologize. 
There is no tram that goes to my door. If you want, I can arrange a station for you. That's okay. I'll take care of it, Li Wen replied, his face devoid of emotion. He then turned around and left the room. The butler, who had been standing by, caught a glimpse through the closing door and thought, Do whatever you want. Caesar took a cigar from the humidor and smiled slightly. I look forward to it. The next day, just after nine o'clock, the unpleasant sound of an old engine reached their ears. Everyone who had been watching from Caesar's side immediately turned their gaze toward him. Lee Wen arrived at the mansion's front door precisely at nine o'clock, stepping off the scooter without uttering a word. Caesar stared at Lee Wen, baffled. What's with that junk? Lee Wen stated matter-of-factly. It's nine o'clock and walked past Caesar as if nothing had happened. Filled with determination, Li Wen strode forward. A smile suddenly appeared on Caesar's face as he anxiously watched Li Wen enter the room following the butler. Caesar left at the same time every day and didn't return until Li Wen finished work. The spacious study room was cluttered with the materials that had occupied the day above, but it wasn't a complete mess. Whoa! Li Wen exclaimed taking a deep breath as he closed the last page. His eyes felt strained, and he felt like he was going crazy, but he managed to do it. There were quite a few highlighted sections, but he had obtained the information he needed. As he raised his head, Li Wen blinked at the scenery outside the window. It must have been daytime when the soft light from the sun was coming in, but now it was completely dark. The train. The thought immediately crossed Li Wen's mind but he contemplated it briefly, and the outcome didn't change. Even amidst his busy schedule, he had managed to go through the documents without disturbing them, and as soon as he opened the study door to leave, he collided violently with someone. Oh no, said the man who caught Lee Wan, preventing him from falling. You always throw yourself with your whole body, the man chuckled. It was Caesar, with a slight smile on his face, looking at him. Due to the impact, Li Wan couldn't react immediately. He was still puzzled by the unexpected situation. In any case, he stared at Caesar blankly and said nothing. Suddenly, the smile disappeared from Caesar's face, and his gaze fixated on Li Wan's parted lips without realizing it. The usual sharpness in Caesar's eyes softened infinitely as he looked at Li Wan. They stared at each other silently for a while, without saying a word. It was a stillness so profound that one could even hear the blink of an eye. Then, Caesar tilted his head slightly, and the arm that held Lee Wan's waist loosened gently. Just as Caesar's breath was about to pass through Lee Wan's moist lips, he suddenly snapped back to reality. The two of them looked at each other, their eyes filled with surprise. Of course, the reasons for their surprise were different. Caught off guard, Lee Wan hurriedly spoke embarrassed by the feeling of emptiness around his waist. I was in a hurry. Li Wen stammered involuntarily before closing his mouth again. You seem quite busy. What's going on? Caesar's face wore the same slight smile as always. Thanks to that, Li Wen managed to calm down a bit and think. It was evident that the train had already left. When Li Wen stepped outside, he saw his scooter smashed into pieces. Caesar, watching Li Wan's anger, pretended not to know what had happened and said, Looks like a fly must have hit it. You'll probably have to stay here until you get a new scooter. Li Wan turned to Caesar and accused. You did this, bandit. Caesar crossed his arms and stood there, looking at Li Wan. Since there was nothing he could do about it, Li Wan quickly returned to the study, threatening to bill Caesar for the overtime. There was only one option. Li Wen frowned angrily as he entered the study. He was soon irritated by another presence behind him. It was Caesar's footsteps. Li Wen walked to the library in silence. He was well acquainted with the documents and arranged them neatly, looking at them. Absent-mindedly rubbing his stomach, he suddenly realized that he had been starving all day. Upon this realization, he grew angry once again. Why the hell did this happen? At this point, he should be lying alone in his bed, uncomfortable yet comforted in his mind, and drift into a peaceful sleep. But he couldn't just spend the entire day looking at paperwork. His scooter was broken, 
leaving him trapped inside the house. On top of it all, he was so hungry that he felt like he was going to pass out. It was better not to dwell on it. When he realized that he had been hungry all day, he felt like he was going crazy. He could really use some chocolate. Li Wan clenched his teeth and decided to maintain his pride. Growling. With thunder rumbling in the distance, Li Wan realized that reason was powerless against the might of instinct. Caesar gasped at Li Wan's contorted and flushed face. By the way, I'm hungry. Li Wan unexpectedly brought up the topic without his usual snarky sarcasm. Wait, I'll have the chef prepare something. Caesar eagerly responded, getting up from his seat. He followed suit, hastily standing up. Why would you wake up a sleeping person? Caesar looked at Li Wan as if he were strange once again. His job is to prepare food whenever and wherever I want. Li Wan replied, irritated by the rumbling in his stomach. Okay, leave him alone. I'll keep it simple. You? Caesar asked, seemingly surprised. Li Wan paused before responding. Where's the kitchen? Where whatever you want, said Caesar with open arms, and Li Wan leaned on the table, surveying the kitchen. It was a splendid kitchen that exceeded his imagination. The most surprising element was the refrigerator, a few giant ones that occupied an entire wall. Li Wan approached it, finding it filled with an abundance of meat and ham, beef, pork, lamb, turkey, and more. However, what surprised him the most was the price of the meat. In the supermarket, he could only longingly gaze at expensive cuts that he couldn't afford. Can I use everything here? Li Wan asked, looking at Caesar with a delighted smile. Caesar sheepishly nodded in response. Li Wan took out a large ham, satisfied, and closed the refrigerator door. Holding the ham with both hands, he looked around and grabbed a big knife in front of Caesar. However, when he tried to cut the ham, the blade got stuck in the thick flesh. Li Wan grew frustrated and grabbed the handle of the knife with both hands, but suddenly, a long arm stretched out from behind. Startled, Li Wan turned around and saw Caesar looking at him with a strange expression. Without saying a word, Caesar let go of Li Wan's hand holding the knife and cut a slice himself. I'll handle it, Caesar said nonchalantly, as if he had anticipated this. After a while, they both finished making sandwiches. The difference between them was striking, with Caesar's sandwich looking delicious. Li Wan, who was famished, took a bite and devoured it quickly. It's good, regardless, he gasped, feeling like he was going to starve. Soon, Li Wan excused himself, claiming to be tired, and left the study. After Caesar's departure, it was just Li Wan and the snacks left. Hesitantly, he reached out and picked up one of the plates. Unfortunately, it wasn't his own. With hesitant lips, he took a bite of Caesar's sandwich. The familiar scent of black bread mixed with a strangely appealing sourness, accompanied by the crisp texture of the vegetables and the tender meat of the fresh ham. The plate quickly emptied. Against the study door leaned a tall man with naturally flowing platinum blonde hair and a roughly dressed shirt. Li Wan realized that the man wasn't going to sleep but was changing clothes. After a while of silence, Li Wan finally spoke. I'll add a condition. If I work overtime, you must provide a late night snack, he said, looking at Caesar with anticipation. Caesar smiled slightly, looking at Li Wan unbelievably. What else do you need? Li Wan quickly turned his head. Nothing so far. Caesar pretended to be indifferent, but his eyes revealed his burning desire. Meanwhile, Touch of, the lawyer in charge of Berdyayev's work, was not behaving well. He was supposed to keep track of the situation and report back. If necessary, he was expected to obtain information through persuasion or threat. If that failed, he was to be eliminated. The mansion was quiet, with only occasional sounds of the butler bringing empty plates or food and the clattering of dishes. Caesar sipped wine slowly while observing Lee Wan, who had been eating without saying a word. Suddenly, Li Wan asked, How's my scooter? Caesar paused as he raised his wine glass to his lips. Finding the parts for that old scooter isn't easy, Caesar casually remarked. A vein pulsed on the side of Li Wan's forehead. 
he stabbed a piece of meat with his fork and wordlessly put it in his mouth. Caesar, setting down his glass after a sip of wine, smiled. The show's schedule at the Bolshoi Theater has changed. How about going tonight? They're performing the Nutcracker, Caesar suggested. Lee Wan looked at him with a blank expression. Will watching the Nutcracker conclude the trial? Lee Wan asked. Caesar chuckled, still smiling. No, it has nothing to do with that, he replied. Li Wan, aware of what would happen, calmly took the last piece of meat into his mouth. After finishing the plate, he wiped his mouth with a napkin and stood up. As Li Wan was about to leave, Caesar spoke again. I came here to work, not to play, he said, heading straight to the library. Li Wan frowned, wondering what was going on in Caesar's mind. The more he thought about it, the more absurd it seemed. Was Caesar asking for a kiss or purposely sabotaging the scooter? With Caesar's current attitude, Li Wan knew the scooter wouldn't arrive until the job was done. He felt lured into Caesar's work and confined to the house. The truth was that he couldn't trust Caesar. If Caesar lost interest halfway and withdrew his support, all of Li Wan's efforts would be in vain. Li Wan formulated a rough plan and mentally assigned tasks. However, there was one obstacle he hadn't considered. As Li Wan was about to focus on the documents, he heard a knock on the study door. It opened, revealing Caesar holding a red rose. It is said that the morning rose blooms for beauty. Caesar gave Li Wan a flower and smiled, as if there was any certainty that Li Wan would happily accept it. But the only thing that came back was Li Wan's cold gaze. This guy is crazy, Caesar thought. He asked Li Wan if he didn't like roses, but Li Wan continued looking at the documents without saying a word. It wasn't easy to concentrate on work with someone determined to interfere. Caesar remarked, It's strange, it suits you perfectly. Even things with thorns. Li Wan closed the papers carefully and raised his head, his face contorted with disgust as he looked at Caesar. What are you doing here? Aren't you working? Li Wan asked coldly. I can do the work at home, Caesar replied. But he didn't stop there. He turned to the couch, found an empty seat, and willingly sat down, surprisingly one. This troublemaker had suddenly calmed down and sat there. Feeling the rush of stress, Li Wan flooded the papers in annoyance. Caesar didn't leave him alone. The paperwork I saw yesterday, where is it? Without saying anything, Li Wan reached out his hand and picked up a stack of papers. Work is good, but sometimes it's good to take a break. Caesar continued. Li Wan didn't reply. Caesar went on speaking. Go your free way as your free soul wills. Demand no reward for your noble deeds. The reward is yours. Caesar laughed briefly, then added. Pushkin is always good. Caesar was now humming Arya and waving the documents Li Wan gave him. Try to disappear even one of those. Li Wan thought internally. I'll kick you out right now. After staring at each other for a while, Li Wan heard a bouquet of roses that Caesar had brought. Caesar was choosing a red rose with beautiful buds. He chose one and took it out. Suddenly, Li Wan saw Caesar leaning towards him. The rosebud lightly hit Li Wan's head, and at the same time, Li Wan angrily yelled, What are you doing? But what happened next was unexpected. A sharp sound was heard and Li Wan's eyes widened in surprise. They stared at each other, both stunned and motionless. Caesar's cheeks slowly reddened, and Li Wan's handprints slowly began to appear. Li Wan was the first to regain his senses. Sorry, I didn't mean to, he said. It was a mistake, but he had slapped Caesar. Caesar was still looking at Li Wan blankly, as if lost in disbelief, not even thinking of touching his slightly swollen cheek. It was the first time Caesar's face looked so foolish. Seeing his bewildered expression, Li Wan decided. Hit me. It was an eye for an eye and a cheek for a cheek. Li Wan brought his face closer to Caesar and closed his eyes, ignoring Caesar's hand, which he had glanced at before closing his eyes. He anticipated a strong hand slapping his cheek, but unexpectedly, Caesar just looked at him. I wish I could have done it sooner. Li Wan thought with a sudden sigh. Something soft touched Li Wan's lips, 
and he stopped in surprise at the unexpected sensation. But it didn't last long. The moment the soft lips lightly sucked on Li Wan's lower lip, he immediately clenched his fists. With a forceful snap, Caesar grabbed Li Wan's other cheek and stepped back. It was the first time Li Wan shouted. What are you doing now? I said hit me. Why did you kiss me? Li Wan was angry, and Caesar laughed naturally in response. I kissed you because you closed your eyes and lifted your face. Caesar explained, pointing to his new handprint and jokingly asking, Is this another kiss? Li Wan clenched his fist again in response to Caesar's willingness. He had hit him without hesitation before, but this time, he didn't strike. Caesar quickly moved away and grabbed Li Wan's wrist, pulling him closer. Suddenly taken aback, Li Wan, Caesar unexpectedly burst out laughing. Unlike Li Wan, who frowned and raised his head immediately, Caesar averted his eyes, his gaze falling on Li Wan's clenched fist, and his lips trailed behind. When Li Wan was surprised by the gentle kiss, Caesar looked up and stared at him. I guess I'll settle for this, Caesar said, letting go of Li Wan's hand. He smiled slightly at Li Wan, who had inadvertently quit, then turned around and left the study. Li Wan stared at the closed study door in silence. By the time he realized the mistake he had made, it was already too late. What, that kid? Li Wan spat out abusive language and kicked the papers on the floor. From early morning, the boisterous noises continued. Li Wan, who suddenly woke up to the sound of footsteps, was puzzled by the unknown landscape that appeared in his sight, but he soon understood. This was not a pension in an old apartment complex. It is a spacious and luxurious room worthy of a grand mansion. He sat down with a feeling that he was not yet familiar with. Footsteps were heard again. When he stepped forward and looked out the window, he saw a family sedan at the ready. It looked like Caesar was about to leave for work. Lee Wan, who was observing the fast-moving men in black suits, thought of something. After Caesar got into the car, the man who returned to the driver's seat started the engine, and the door that had been locked suddenly opened. When Caesar turned his head, Li Wan quickly went upstairs, closed the door, and said, Let me come with you. Caesar frowned and spoke nonchalantly while looking straight ahead. What are you talking about? Li Wan opened his mouth with a suspicious look. I'm not leaving until I finish. I'm going out to buy a book. Caesar turned his head and blinked through the mirror. The driver, who looked nervous, hastily started the car. Behind the smoothly running car, the members of the organization were still in line. The car left the mansion and entered the road as the snow gradually thickened. Li Wan, who was looking out the window, opened his mouth as soon as the sedan was about to head towards the crowd of passing cars. I'll get off here, he said. Caesar asked as the man stopped and looked through the mirror. Li Wan put on his coat collar and headed out. Following him, Caesar got out of the car and looked at him with a straight back. Li Wan blinked in embarrassment and looked at Caesar. Is there something to do nearby? He asked, puzzled. Caesar held out what was in his hand. It was a shapka. Walking down the street without a hat is dangerous. Caesar spoke in a calm voice and put the shapka on Li Wan's head. Caesar put a shapka on Li Wan and looked at him silently. Li Wan said without hesitation, Thank you. I'll return it to you when I get home. Where is the station? Li Wan replied without much thought to the calm voice. It's right there. So I just... After a brief goodbye, Li Wan continued walking. Suddenly, he heard footsteps behind him. The sound of men's shoes fitting together, like an army, kept haunting him. Li Wan hesitated and looked back. And at the same time, he saw Caesar following him, with dozens of men in black suits trailing behind. Why are you following me? Li Wan, who arrived at the station just in time, turned around and asked. Opposite Li Wan, Caesar smiled in response to his frowning expression. I want to go with you. Li Wan didn't say anything. He simply looked at him with a puzzled expression. Li Wan turned around with an angry face and boarded the train that had just arrived. Caesar followed him, followed by the men in black suits. After rush hour, the silent train was filled with burly men. 
This seat is empty, Tsar. At someone's call, Caesar turned his head. The person occupying the seat involuntarily moved, caught in an unexpected situation, and was forced to stand up suddenly. After a few stations passed, Li Wen was the first to get off the train when he finally reached his destination. The famous bookstores in the city had books of all sizes. The bookstore, which was always full of customers, was quite crowded even in the morning. His purpose was very clear. Li Wen quickly looked around the bookshelves to find the section with law-related books. He then took out a few books that stood out and examined their contents. After selecting a few books, he turned to look at Caesar. Mr. Lawyer. Li Wen furrowed his brows involuntarily as his voice echoed in the quiet bookstore. Caesar walked out between the men who immediately made way. It's a gift. With a smile, Caesar looked at the book that he held out to Li Wen. It read, a dish that anyone can easily cook. A blood vessel sprouted on Li Wen's forehead. I don't need it. As he recalled the embarrassing memories he had buried, anger swelled up inside him. If things continue like this, it will be a mocking feeling for the rest of his life. Please count, Li Wen said as he put down the book, and the staff started checking the amount one by one. Along with this, Caesar said, disgustingly throwing away the cookbook, and smiled happily. Li Wen thought to himself, and opened his mouth with a stern expression. What the hell are you doing? I don't need it. Caesar's reaction was unexpectedly serious. No way. You really need it. Someday you will die of food poisoning. Seeing him shake his head with a smile, his mouth tightened. Why all of a sudden? Until now I've lived a good life cooking like this. Life is more precious than pride. Seriously reconsider. I looked it up and it looks pretty good. The staff looked at them blankly. It's 1,324 rubles. Receiving the bill that the clerk handed him along with the change, the one radiated seething irritation from his body and stormed through a dilapidated alley with few people. Suddenly, children ran from inside the alley screaming. With no time to escape, they were surrounded by children. Looking at the dirty faces and old clothes, Li Wen soon realized that they were street kids. Foreigners and the rich are good targets for them. Meditate or pickpocket. Suddenly, Caesar mercilessly punched the child who had run towards him. The slender body of the boy, who could not eat well and was drenched in drugs, could not even scream, and he flew away. Caesar immediately took out a gun from his coat and put the gun to the forehead of another boy who had grabbed his coat. Li Wen, who had become contemplative, widened his eyes, and the surprised children screamed and ran away. Li Wen was frozen as he was. The goosebumps that he had felt earlier ran all over Li Wen's body a man with no expression on his face, pointing a gun at such a small boy relentlessly. A face that doesn't feel laughter, anger, sadness or any emotion as it takes someone's life. His face expressionless and frozen, Caesar pointed his gun at the boy. There was a click, and the safety of the gun was released. At that moment, Li Wen realized this man was pulling the trigger without flinching. Stop! Belatedly, Li Wen yelled and interrupted the two of them. In an instant, Caesar pointed his gun into the air, and a ghastly shot pierced the air. He touched me. What about that? What the hell are you thinking about pointing a gun at something a kid did? Caesar kept looking at Li Wen with a confused expression. It's like he doesn't know why he's so mad at him. I don't know why you criticize me. I just did what I had to do. Shoot a child? At Li Wen's harsh voice, Caesar coldly asked. What's the difference with a child? Li Wen was speechless. However, Caesar didn't give Li one time to collect his thoughts. If that's all you have to say, step aside. Caesar aimed the gun again. This time, he intends to shoot the boy. Surprised, Li one unknowingly wrapped his arms around the boy and stepped back. Li one bit his lip and looked at Caesar again. If you want to shoot, shoot me. What? Caesar paused and frowned. Li Wen looked directly at him and said in a high-pitched voice, Can't you understand? If you're going to shoot this kid, shoot me first. 
I even hit you, right? Based on what you said, I'd be severely executed. Why not? Can you shoot? Caesar, who had been silently observing Li Wan, lowered his gun. Simultaneously, the boy took a deep breath and fled in panic. Once he confirmed the boy's escape, Li Wan turned his attention back to Caesar, who now held the gun in his arms. Relief flooded through Li Wan's shoulders, followed by anger. Just as he was about to speak up, Caesar's gaze shifted to something behind Li Wan, and he swiftly moved. Caught off guard by the unexpected action, Li Wan hastily followed his line of sight. He had a dreadful thought that Caesar was going to shoot the fleeing boy, but he was mistaken. Caesar bent down and retrieved something partially buried. As he turned around, Li Wan recognized the object. It was the envelope containing the books that he had tossed at Caesar. With the books in hand, Caesar wiped his eyes and looked up. He walked over to Li Wan willingly and handed him the envelope. What happened next caught Li Wan completely off guard. Caesar's subsequent words and expressions left him speechless. You can't afford to lose this. It's a book that could save your life, isn't it? Caesar spoke softly and smiled at Li Wan. Taken aback by the sudden change, Li Wan stared at him blankly. Are you all right? Li Wan asked, and Caesar tilted his head. What? Li Wan couldn't contain his emotions and yelled. How can you do that to a child? Li Wan's voice, which had been raised in anger, gradually calmed down. Still, Caesar looked at him with a perplexed expression. A moment of disappointment followed. To him, life held no value, not even that of a child. When Li Wan fell silent, his phone rang. An urgent call came through, and one of the organization members approached to deliver the message. There's a car waiting nearby. What should we do? Caesar nodded and turned his gaze toward Li Wan. Are you finished? Let's go back. Li Wan, who had remained silent until then, spoke up to Caesar, who effortlessly extended his hand. I'm finished. I'll go alone. Caesar frowned. Li Wan let out a harsh exhale, his voice breaking. Can't you listen to people? I told you I want to go alone. Li Wan forcefully grabbed the envelope from Caesar's hand and turned away. Caesar didn't dare catch a glimpse of Li Wan as he walked away. Li Wan could sense Caesar's gaze upon him, but he didn't look back. After all, the man would never understand why he was so angry. The entire city was blanketed in white from the snow that had fallen overnight. The sound of snow being cleared could be heard in the morning, but the snowfall continued. Li Wan rose at his usual time and made his way to the dining table. As expected, Caesar was already seated. Upon hearing the footsteps, he turned his head, looked at Li Wan's face, and immediately smiled. It's snowing again. Li Wan took his seat without uttering a word. Getting to work is becoming difficult. I might have to work from home for a while, Caesar continued, attempting to engage in conversation with the still silent Li Wan. It's said that sprinkling salt prevents snow accumulation. Hey! Suddenly, Li Wan interrupted Caesar's words. Caesar looked at him, still smiling, and Li Wan spoke with an expressionless face. I'm not in the mood to talk to you. That was the end. After delivering a cold warning, Li Wan calmly ate the food brought by the butler, refraining from further conversation. Caesar, with his hand on his chin, observed Li Wan and eventually shrugged. Are you going to stay in the study and work? Caesar pretended not to hear Li Wan's words. Instead of responding, Li Wan silently brought the food to his mouth. Picking roses in the greenhouse. Before Caesar could finish his sentence, Li Wan placed the napkin down and stood up. Enjoy your meal. Caesar watched as Li Wan left without bidding farewell to the butler. The butler, who was clearing the empty plates, looked at Caesar and asked, Why is he behaving like this? I don't know, Caesar replied. I have no idea why he's so angry. How can a man who can point a gun at a child without hesitation laugh, joke, and act as if nothing happened? It's evident that he is devoid of empathy, yet he smiles as if nothing is amiss. He is an enigmatic man. Li Wan was disturbed by Caesar's actions. 
it would be better to hurry back. Recalling his determination, he hastened toward the study. The lawyer was sitting on the couch, checking documents. He was solving cases about land. He had some questions about the papers and still had to go to Caesar. He had been avoiding him for days. For the first time, Yvonne went to him himself. For once, Caesar showed up before he could think of him. While walking down the corridor, the lawyer met a servant who offered to help him. He asked where Caesar was now. He was in his private living room, which was at the end of the hallway on the first floor. The lawyer thanked him and went to Caesar. He hesitantly opened the doors, and it turned out to be the place he had been invited to on his first visit. As he walked around the room, he saw many beautiful flowers, since there was also a greenhouse. He saw Caesar resting after reading a book. He slept like a baby and looked like an angel. Yvonne wanted to wake him up by stroking his head. Caesar opened his eyes abruptly and drew his gun, pointing it at the lawyer. He only had time to wince. Caesar recognized the guy after a few seconds and put the gun away. He calmed down and said, It could have ended very badly. He asked him that the next time Yvonne woke him up, he should call him by his first name. Otherwise, he might be very sorry. He stood up and clapped him on the shoulder as he was surprised that Yvonne spoke to him. Vaughn went straight to the point. He wanted to clarify something. Caesar agreed, but it should all take place over a cup of tea. After making tea, Caesar asked what was going to be discussed. He acted as if nothing had happened. Without letting his guard down, Ivan began a dialogue. It was about the territory where Zdanov and the former head of the city worked together. The owner's name was different there. Caesar asked if he wanted to find this man. Ivan waved his head. He had yet to find out. But he thought the man might be the key. If possible, he would have to be persuaded to testify in their favor. Caesar pretended to understand almost nothing. Yvonne continued to explain to him, but then he was interrupted by a very strange question. Caesar asked if he was scary. The lawyer didn't know what he was talking about. Caesar said he was wary of him. He just thought a mafioso was a mafioso. He asked if Yvonne was mad at him for wanting to shoot the child. But the lawyer replied that he just didn't understand him, just as he didn't understand Caesar. Caesar continued, saying he was interested in him. Ivan was in shock. Everything he had done before was to lock Ivan up here. Ivan wondered, or was it all a show of interest? But Caesar just looked down at the floor, as if he'd done something nasty. Then, Caesar stroked his hair. He stood up and... Vaughn jumped up abruptly and said he was going to work and he ran off. He just smiled and sat down on the couch. The lawyer was shocked by what had just happened. He remembered that moment and the words Caesar had said. He stared at the door and said he was just playing with it. It was morning, and Yvonne noticed that it had finally stopped snowing. He was in a good mood, and he was whistling. As he was leaving his office, he met Caesar at the door. He again missed a good chance to hug the lawyer. He only thought Caesar was playing with him. Yvonne irritated, he gave Caesar a stack of documents and ordered him to check them, slamming the door one last time. Caesar laughed. Already in the office, Yvonne wondered what could be so interesting to play with a person like that. He sat down at his desk and wondered when it would all stop. His mind was a mess, so he decided to go for a walk. As he left the office, he again ran into the servant, who again offered his help. But Ivan didn't need it, and said he would just go for a walk. He bowed and told him to wait a short time. Then, a few minutes later, he brought the lawyer a hat with ear flaps. So he wouldn't be cold. The servant said that the king had asked him to give it to you before he left. Ivan took the hat, thanked him, and said he would be back before dinner. The servant said he could take his time, as he could set the table at Ivan's convenience. He thanked him and left. The lawyer wanted to get information about the cases of the former head of the city sooner, and finally finish the case. But he did not like the fact that the king did nothing for it, although he himself offered to help him. It seems the only good thing about him was his face, the lawyer said. He remembered his bigger and longer arms and thought he was a good fighter. He stopped and waved his head, saying he wasn't thinking straight. He struck a tree in anger 
and a pile of snow fell from the branches, which covered the lawyer. The walk was unsuccessful, and he went home. He was very cold and wanted to eat. He thought about asking his servant to prepare something while he took off his wet clothes. But first, he wanted to take a hot bath to warm himself up. As he was about to open the door, he heard a strange sound coming from his room. He saw someone rummaging through his nightstand. He immediately asked who it was. The man in black got up and wanted to run away. But Yvonne grabbed him. He swung and struck the robber in the head. The room was too dark to see anything, so the lawyer went to look for a light switch. But then the robber grabbed the man's leg, and he fell down without realizing what had just happened. He saw the burglar swing a vase and hit him over the head with all his might, so that the vase shattered. But Yvonne survived and kicked the mugger in the leg so that he fell. The lawyer had only one job to do, and that was to turn on the lights. But then he heard the sound of an engine outside the window. Without expecting it, the man was struck in the back of the head by the robber from the elbow. Yvonne held himself together so he wouldn't lose consciousness. But his eyes blurred, and the last thing he saw before he collapsed was the robber leaving the room. Later, the butler enters the room and turns on the light, which causes the lawyer to wake up. His head was covered in blood. The butler immediately asked what happened here and if the guy was okay. He got up and immediately started asking about the strange man who was leaving his room. But the butler saw no one, and the rest of the servants of the house were gathered in the passage. They, too, ran to the noise. He was immediately called a doctor and asked that Yvonne not get up. He had a severe headache. But then King came into the room before he could ask what had happened. The lawyer immediately said that someone had broken into the house. The king extended his hand to the lawyer, offering his assistance. He helped him to stand up. He turned his gaze to the butler, who immediately began to bow, apologizing for not being able to keep track of everything. At the same time, he promised that it would not happen again. The king ordered him to inspect the house for anyone unauthorized, and he immediately went to carry out the order. Caesar cradled him in his arms and told them to go to his room to wait for the doctor. But the lawyer went to see what the robber had taken with him. He took out a nightstand and turned it over. There was a folder glued to the bottom of it. The king asked him what it was. That was the most important thing. Yvonne didn't care what he stole, as long as he didn't take with him the contents of the file he was now holding. It was strange to the lawyer that in the midst of a huge house, an unknown person had chosen his room. It was not a coincidence. He thought it had something to do with the case he was working on. The king was worried about him. He asked if his head hurt badly, but the lawyer said not much. The king handed him a handkerchief. The king put the handkerchief in his hands and then squeezed his shoulder. Yvonne shuddered. They were interrupted by a doctor who knocked on the door. Yvonne's heart was beating fast. The doctor examined him and quickly bandaged all the wounds, saying that would be all. Then he asked Yvonne or something troubling him, but without giving an answer. The king interrupted him, asking the doctor if he would have a scar after the blow. Yvonne replied, If anything, you can cover it with a tattoo. But the king replied that he had bad taste. The doctor said he would be fine, because the wound wasn't that big. He gathered his things and went. Suddenly, the guard bursts into the room and tells Basu that they turned the whole house upside down but they didn't find anyone suspicious, not even a sign of forced entry. But the problem was that Yvonne didn't even remember what he looked like because there was no light in the room. All he noticed was that he was a grown man, nothing more. The king praised him for his courage and added that he was not bad either for being able to injure him and escape. A lawyer would have looked at Tsar to see how he would have handled such a situation. The king told the others to take steps to strengthen their guard, for it was their mistake to lose the intruder. He ominously recommended that they look at themselves in the mirror to see if their heads were there. The guard bowed low and apologized, saying it would never happen again. In the end, they didn't touch the documents, and they didn't find anything suspicious. They could not believe that they were able to let him go. The king told Yvonne to get some rest today, 
for he had been through a lot today. He offered to escort him to another room. The lawyer agreed. The next day came. The king asked if he had slept well and immediately added that Yvonne did not need to worry because he had beefed up his guards. He had realized this long ago as there was a crowd of guards surrounding the men. The king said that these guards would be the ones standing outside and that everything inside would remain the same. The priority was to provide security outside and around the greenhouse. After breakfast, Yvonne went to his study and noticed that the king had really increased the number of guards outside the house. He decided that he would not go out until he had finished all his business. Suddenly, Yvonne heard a knock at the door. It was the butler. He asked if the lawyer was resting. He brought him some tea. But Yvonne was surprised, because usually he would come and leave tea. But now he wasn't going anywhere. Was Butler interested, or was he very surprised yesterday? The lawyer thought the butler had come to check on his well-being, fearing Caesar's wrath. The butler blamed himself for Yvonne's suffering yesterday, but he denied that it was all right, that he was not to blame for anything. After all, luckily nothing was missing. But the butler was surprised that Yvonne was so good at fighting. The lawyer replied that it was just self-defense, and he got lucky. The important thing was that nothing was missing. The tea was bitter. Yvonne wondered if it had taken too long to brew. Suddenly, he was floating, his eyes blurred. He jumped up abruptly and realized he had no strength at all. The last thing he saw was the butler's face. He was smiling. In the car, the Tsar was told that the mouse was caught, and the Tsar went to it. Meanwhile, Igor was looking for important documents of the lawyer. He was the traitor and the one who attacked Ivan at night. Among all the scattered documents on the table, he had to find the ones that were in the folder. And so he looked under the desk and saw them. He took them, and before he could make a move, he was surrounded by guards who had guns to his head. Then the king came into the room. As he said, they ended up grabbing his long rat tail. He was only silent. Yvonne woke up. He felt so warm and happy. He looked up and thought it was his mother. But he was wrong. Caesar was carrying him in his arms, wrapped in a blanket. Caesar said it was all right, and he could still sleep. After kissing him, the king said they were headed to his bedroom. Yvonne felt strange. But King said it would be like this for a couple more days, and he needed a good rest. It looks like there was poison in the tea. Yvonne began to tell how the butler gave him the tea. But before he could finish, the king said he already knew everything and had already dealt with everything. His papers were in order. It turned out that the king knew about everything. And to Yvonne came the realization that he was just a bait, just a tool to expose the traitor. The lawyer broke free from the king's hands and fell to the floor. He didn't even feel pain. So how strong was the poison? The king worried about him, telling Yvonne to be careful. He offered to go to his room and rest. The king wanted to lift him up. But as soon as he touched him, he immediately pushed him away, saying he was able to go himself. But then the king rose abruptly to his feet and embraced him saying that he did not think of him as chess piece to be used. Suddenly, Yvonne passed out. The king was frightened and began to shout his name. Caesar immediately carried him into the bedroom. He laid him down and sat beside him. The king stroked him behind the ear. But suddenly, they were interrupted by a voice from the corridor. It was the guard who wanted to report something to him. The king told him to wait for him. He got up and opened the door. The guard reported that they had already dealt with the traitor and asked what to do with him next. The Tsar told me to cut it up and send it to Tichev, and also to add a postcard. The guard asked what to write there. The man smiled and said, write him this. So you don't forget your things at my place again. The guard bowed and left. The king returned to the lawyer, who was still in bed. He leaned over and smiled, then told him to rest well. Later, Yvonne woke up. The butler who was in his room said he was awake in time for breakfast. He pointed him to the bathroom, new clothes, and said as soon as you're done, you can go downstairs. Yvonne was surprised at where he was. He guessed that Caesar had brought him here. 
Once again, he recognized this mansion as luxurious, even though he knew it. He couldn't believe he'd been so easily fooled. Well, it was his own fault for not being careful enough in the abode of the mafiosi. But what is scarier, because of this poison, he introduced himself so obscenely. He jumped up and went to the bathroom to wash up. He saw the new clothes and noticed that there was a new butler in the house, wondering what had happened to the old one. He washed and changed his clothes and went to breakfast. Caesar was already waiting for him at the table. He asked how he slept, but the lawyer wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone right now. At the table, he asked what had happened to the last butler, to which Caesar replied, he was laid off. It annoyed him the way he breathed. But such an answer did not satisfy Yvonne, and he asked the king for a normal answer, for he had a right to know. The king said it was better for him not to know. He tried to get the information by blackmail, but he never said anything. Then Tsar said that he found a witness. He found someone who had lent land to Zdanov and Berdyev. Meanwhile, at Lomonosov's house, his servant came to report to him. He said that lately, the Sergeyevs had been taking strange actions. They got rid of Berdev, and now they are targeting his property. Lomonosov was surprised. He wondered who had dared to encroach on Lomonosov's property. It was the king. The servant said that they would continue to watch him, and if the occasion arose, they would strike. Caesar Sergeyev was a bandit to the bone, a monster without tears or blood. Lomonosov ordered to continue in the same way. They wanted to know how dirty ways the Tsar uses, but now he does everything according to the law. He only knows that all of Berdyaev's property belongs to them. This was clearly a provocation. One might think that the Tsar had challenged the Lomonosovs. The servant gave Lomonosov a report on what he had learned. But there was very little information, because the Tsar engaged a lawyer. They gather all the evidence in Sargiev's mansion, so it was very difficult for them to get anything. The chief told them to take it and just get a lawyer. But he didn't wait for an answer. The servant continued the story. Since Yvonne works in the king's house, it was difficult for them to get to him, unless they could invade the mansion. Lomonosov began to flip through the folder of documents, and on one of the pages he just froze. As he saw a photo of the very same lawyer, he noticed that he was not a pure-blooded Russian. The chief wondered how that could even be, and got up from his bunk, saying that it was time for him to move. He went about his business. After all, he could not allow Sergeyev's heir to do whatever he wanted. Meanwhile, outside, the lawyer complained that he was cold and wanted to go back to a warm hotel. They are going somewhere. After these words, he was embraced by the king. He was warmer than the lawyer. Ivan was in agreement with him, but only if he himself wore someone else's fur. A cab arrived. They got into it, and the lawyer showed a piece of paper with the address written on it. The cab driver was surprised because it was in the middle of nowhere. He asked why they were going there, but Ivan just told him to go faster because he and the king were in a hurry. The cab driver looked at Tsar and asked if he was a celebrity by any chance. After all, he had seen it in the newspapers. But he didn't look at the text, and that's a good thing. The cab driver kept asking why they were going there, and Tsar was about to shut him up. But the lawyer saved the situation. He said they were just going there to rest, and hinted at him to go faster. And on the way, he asked if he could take a picture with the Tsar. He thought he was a star. He said he would keep the photo as a family heirloom his whole life, and he wouldn't take a penny in return. It was very dangerous, not worth pissing off the Tsar, the lawyer thought. There was a tense atmosphere in the car. Despite the dangerous situation, their unexpected journey had been planned two days earlier. The king forced the lawyer to choose which question to answer. The butler or the witness, he had to choose. He knew that the witness was bait for the lawyer, which he would not miss for anything. If he got him, Nikolai's case would be solved. He chose the witness. The king was handed the paper and asked whether the lawyer would go there himself. He said that he would go there at once, and at the same time he put his hand to the paper. The king offered to gather his men and send for him, but the lawyer refused to help. After all, 
he wanted Tiki information the normal way. As a result, they will go there together. Especially for this, the king will set aside two days and will go together to Yvonne. The lawyer asked why Caesar should go with him. Caesar said that since he had given him the information, he had every right to go with him. Yvonne refused him, but he was so stubborn that he agreed. In the end, the lawyer imposed three conditions on their journey. The first one was, don't carry a gun with you. Two, don't drag your sixes around with you. Third, don't look like a mobster. Already in the car, Yvonne was surprised that Caesar stuck to the terms. Even though he didn't look like an ordinary man, it was hard to call him a real mafia man either. But his face was ugly. How could it be the face of one who calmly pointed a gun at a man? One who takes advantage of people on a whim. The car stopped at the lake. The guys got out of the car and walked to the hotel. The hotel would have been in terrible condition, though it looked better from afar. The boys took another look around, but this hotel was the only one in the area. Yvonne opened the door, but there was a man behind him. He let him through the front. It was cozy inside, and better than the outside. The man who climbed in front of them asked to arrange a room for him. The lawyer looked at him and rated him as a friendly guy. The woman who gives out the license plates noticed the lawyer and apologized for taking so long. Yvonne said it was okay. They had just arrived. He impressed the woman with his beauty, so much so that she froze on the spot. On the side, her husband gave her a logbook. She asked if they wanted one room, but the lawyer told her to give them two single rooms. But unfortunately for the lawyer, there was only one room. They had two rooms left, but the man who had come earlier had taken one of them. But the room that was left had room for two. There was a large bed, and as it turned out, it was the only hotel in the vicinity. The king said in advance that he was satisfied with everything and asked Yvonne an uncomfortable question he asked or he was afraid of him. He trembled, and yet he agreed to that room. The lawyer asked if it was a small village, to which the girl replied, yes, since it was a small village. Everyone knew each other here. That's what the lawyer was waiting for. He leaned over to her and said he was looking for someone here. He asked if she knew Vasily Shishkin. He was told that he lived at this address. He handed her the paper with the address. She said that a person with a different name lived at this address. It turned out that he had moved here recently. Truth be told, they didn't know each other very well because he rarely left the house and interacted with anyone. He asked for the house, and the woman pointed her finger in the direction of the house. It was a house with a red roof. Vaughn looked at Caesar. He wondered what was wrong with him, but then as he looked, he was horrified. He saw the little girl wanting something from him. He looked at her as if he wanted to kill her, but she was saved in time by her mother. She said she was just a little girl and didn't quite know what she was doing. She took her in her arms, and she began to hold him by the coat. The lawyer was surprised at how restrained Caesar was. After all, he was always holding a gun in his sleep and here some girl was just touching him. Caesar looked at the girl with a fearful look, and when she looked at him, she could not stand it and cried. At this time, the lawyer gave her money and said that when they returned, they would be shown the room. He turned to Caesar and menacingly told them to talk outside. Caesar liked that. Caesar thought he really wanted to be alone, but it was too late. He wanted to rest in his room. The lawyer reiterated to him who the reason they came out was. But they didn't have much time to argue. The boys didn't know what name he'd taken, but it was definitely false. And they needed to find out right away. They went looking for the witness's house. The house was found. The lawyer rang the bell, and a man opened the door. He was all shabby, with bags under his eyes. As soon as Ivan asked him if he was Vasily Shishkin, the man immediately closed the door and said they were in the wrong place. But he grabbed the door and told him to wait. Yvonne said that Mr. Berdiaev was dead and they wanted to talk about him. He offered to do it inside. The man frighteningly said they had nothing to talk to them about. But the lawyer insisted that the crowd let them in. But Caesar intervened in their conversation. He grabbed the man by the neck and told him to let them go for good. 
The lawyer was against such methods, but it still worked, and the man let strangers into his house. The amazing thing was that the king was so tall that he could not just walk through the doorway. He had to sit down first, and only then could he get into the house. Caesar saw that there were no chairs in the house, but the man immediately set up a chair for him. They sat down at the table and began negotiations. The lawyer wanted to know something about Berdyov's past, and nothing more. The lawyer said that he was looking into cases concerning corrupt practices on his part, and he managed to find evidence that a man, Mr. Shishkin, was involved in it. The man went pale after these words. The king took off his gloves and pulled out his knife. The man immediately stood up and began to tremble. The lawyer asked him to hide his knife, which the czar actually did. Vaughn asked him to answer his question. He told them everything, and the lawyer thanked him. But then Caesar started asking questions. He asked if he wanted to meet with Berdyaev. Vaughn didn't like it. He begged him in his mind to shut up. The lawyer said, Caesar just likes to joke around, and he's not going to do anything to hurt him. He asked the man not to worry. The man got up and said he needed a glass of water. The guys themselves wanted to give him a few minutes to get his thoughts in order. Ivan had a suspicious feeling. Something was clearly wrong. Shishkin came into the room, but he had a gun in his hands. He pointed it at the guests and told them not to move. Vaughn told him to calm down and that they came in peace. He asked me to put his letter down. But before he could speak, Shishkin fired. The bullet flew past the lawyer's head and only lightly grazed his cheek. Then his hands were taken by the king. He whipped out the gun and he clobbered the poor man. The lawyer shouted for him to let him go. The king first froze and only then let the poor man go. Ivan apologized to him and assured him that they had come in good faith and meant him no harm. The king, meanwhile, pushed the gun away so that a similar situation would not occur again. Shishkin was greatly frightened. He could not look at the Tsar because he was very frightened. In such an environment, normal dialogue is out of the question. The lawyer left his card and said if there was anything he could call him, and he was staying at a hotel nearby, and finally told him not to worry. The doors closed, and then Yvon began to get angry with Caesar because he was breaking those three rules. He told him not to dress like a mobster. The king said he was only negotiating, and this he called negotiations. The lawyer then asked him about the knife he had brought with him. He replied that there was nothing in the rules about edged weapons, so that was why he had brought it. But when Yvon talked about weapons, he talked about weapons in general. All kinds of weapons. Then the king said that if he hadn't, the lawyer would have died. He agreed with him. Then he thanked him. The guy warned me if he ever did that again, he'd take his knife away and cut something off. But the czar was not afraid of these warnings. The guys went to the hotel. Meanwhile, in the house, Shishkin was panicking hard. He ran all the way here, but they found him anyway. He knew that all these cases would be investigated, and that's why he came all the way here. He wondered what would happen to him. He thought about death, but while he still had a chance, he looked at the lawyer's card. He thought if he told the lawyer everything, he might be able to help him. Suddenly, a gun was held to his head. Shishkin didn't even hear his footsteps. He was all in black. Shishkin asked who it was. The man replied that he knew it himself. He had already guessed who it was, but before he could say a word, a shot rang out. Already at the hotel, the woman said she took their luggage to the room. The room was the largest in the hotel and also had a working light. Fortunately, there was a bunk bed. Yvonne wondered if this was definitely the only room, or if there were others. But unfortunately, there was only one room. She said goodnight and left. The lawyer thought that the Tsar had never been to such places, but it turned out to be the opposite. He had been to similar places when he was four, then seven, and then twelve. It turned out that it wasn't family or financial problems. The reason for this was his kidnapping. Vaughn was shocked. The king said that twice he had been kidnapped, and once it was just a game. After all, he had to get out on his own if he was kidnapped or taken prisoner. Thanks to this, at 12, he was able to escape without any problems. It turned out that he had been kidnapped by the Lomonosovs. 
They just wanted to kill him. Each time they failed to do so, but maybe one day they would get lucky. To say that Yvonne was shocked is to say nothing. The lawyer then said that they were tired and it was time to go to bed. He asked who was on top and who was on the bottom. But the king said it wasn't his style to cower under anyone. But the lawyer was talking about the bed. They went to bed. But Yvonne was somehow afraid to spend the night with him. Surely because the guy was worried a lot. He couldn't sleep. It was like Caesar couldn't sleep either. But then he got up and walked over to the lawyer, who pretended to be asleep. He thought Caesar was following him. Then King went to the closet, opened the door, and pulled out a gun. The king sat down across from the lawyer. As a result, the lawyer did not sleep that night. In the morning, they went to breakfast. He couldn't figure out what Tsar had been doing all night. Yvonne had planned to have breakfast and then visit Shishkin. The king looked like he had slept all night. He didn't look like he was tired in any way. Then the lawyer accidentally poured a cup of syrup on the man's feet. He apologized, but the man said it was okay. The lawyer and the man got to know each other. The man's name is Leonid. They both didn't get much sleep that night, and in honor of that, they shook hands. It turned out that Leonid had also spilled on someone, and there was no one near him. But by chance, Leonid doused Ivan with syrup. The king did not like this commotion. He watched suspiciously from the sidelines. Leonid took Ivan's hand and said that his hands were made to play the piano. Then he took and licked the syrup from his fingers. He smiled and said it was very sweet. Ivan could not understand what had just happened. Then the king stood up for him. He stood like a rock behind Ivan. He was very angry. But the lawyer didn't want to turn it into a fight. Ivan said he had to go, but Leonid asked him to stay and pick something up. He held out his hand and gave him the button. But he seemed to have seen it somewhere before. And since then, the king has been darker than a cloud. The guys went to Shishkin. They knocked and rang, but no one made a sound. Then they saw that the door was ajar. The guys went in, and there was a horrible smell in the house. And then they saw a dead body. The king hugged Ivan and said they were too late. The man said that Shishkin is definitely dead by now, even if he is alive. It's only worse. The king had seen this once before. The corpse was tied to a chair. It was the handwriting of the Lomonosovs. The Tsar drew his pistol and went to look around. When the lawyer came closer to the body, he saw that his jacket was missing one button. He took out the button that Leonid had given him this morning and compared it to the missing one. He realized it was the same button. The king came back and said there was no one. Vaughn was a lawyer, but he didn't know anything about people. But the lawyer said it was just the work of a real pro, and there was nothing to be complained about. He didn't leave any evidence but a dead body. It turned out that Tsar understood everything from the moment they arrived, where they met at the counter. The king was suspicious of him from the moment they encountered him, explaining that he was simply suspicious. Later, they left. Caesar looked toward the mountain and said that it would soon hail and then bullets started flying out of the hotel windows. The king immediately covered Yvonne, and after it had subsided, he told him to run away. Leonid turned out to be the shooter. He praised Tsar for his excellent reflexes and hid the gun in his bag. It will be an interesting hunt. The lawyer ran away somewhere in the woods, but it was hard to find shelter there. The king guessed that this shooting was just intimidation. The shooter would hunt quietly until he cornered them. Suddenly, something stirred in the bushes, and King and Ivan hid behind a rock. Caesar drew his gun and pointed it at the bushes. It turned out to be a cat. The king took off his coat, and it turned out that he had been wounded. Ivan, when he saw this, first touched his face and then asked if he was hurt. The king took his hand and kissed it. But then he let go and said that the main thing now is to survive. Then Caesar jumped out and ran over behind a tree. There was still someone in the bushes. Vaughn was stunned that King was wounded. He felt badly for him. Then King stretched out his arm and shot into the bushes. Yvonne didn't notice anything. He was sure there was no one in the bushes. Then the King took the lawyer by the hand and they ran away. In the meantime, the shot Leonid was sitting in the bushes, 
surprised that he was trying to protect a lawyer. Leonid was burning with the desire to kill the Tsar. In his head, he already imagined how he would kill him. In the snowfall, the lawyer treated King's wound. He tied a scarf around the wound, but it was not enough to stop the bleeding. Time was playing against them. They urgently needed to find a way to get things done. Caesar saw the lawyer was on guard. He took and hugged him, saying it was just leaves, that there was no danger yet. Ivan covered him with his fur coat, took off his glove, and began to touch Tsar by the neck. He was checking his temperature. The king said he would protect him no matter what. He remembered his younger years, how his mother had said she would protect him. Even in this situation, the king was calm. Ivan was surprised by this and wondered what he had to go through to be calm in such a situation. He didn't know what the king was thinking, why he was defending him. The lawyer understood that he was helpless in this situation. So he ordered the king to sit quietly until he could figure out how to get out of here. Caesar loses consciousness and remembers how his tutor wanted to kill him. The woman was afraid to do it herself because she needed to kill little Caesar. He said she couldn't kill him. Then a shot rang out and the girl fell to the floor. Caesar threw the knife at her faster than the bullet flew. And in such situations, Caesar constantly survived. But someday he too. Before he could say anything, he woke up abruptly. The king came to his senses. There was only one bullet left in his gun, and the shooter was already coming. The king hugged the lawyer and told him to run as soon as he fired. He told him to stay alive. He pushed Ivan away and... Ivan brought Caesar to the hotel. The hostess was frightened as soon as she saw it. The lawyer called for a doctor. Later, he put Caesar to bed, wrapped a blanket around him, and began treating his wounds. The landlady burst into the room with the doctor. She explained everything to the doctor, and he began to examine the patient. He asked the woman to come out so that it would be just him and Yvonne in the room. She left the room. The doctor began to say that about where they were. He had heard the sounds of gunshots, as he often walked there. The doctor wondered whether it was the lawyer's handiwork. He just didn't want outsiders making a mess in the village. The bullet went through, he said. The doctor gave the king first aid and the bleeding stopped. He said as soon as the king wakes up, they will have to leave this place. He did not want the quiet and peaceful village to be disturbed. He slammed the door and left. Caesar woke up, and the first thing he saw was his mistress's baby. Katya had painted his bandages with drawings of flowers. Vaughn came running into the room. He was glad the king was awake. The king said in a hoarse voice that he was fine. At that moment, Katya came in and brought a glass of water to the victim. The king took the glass and drank the water. The girl said that the king was like an angel, with beautiful hair and eyes. He was a copy of the picture the girl had seen in church. The king handed the glass back, and at that moment it was hit by a bullet. The glass shattered into pieces. Everyone was shocked. Then another bullet flew in, hitting a vase on the table. Yvonne was shocked by what he saw. And Caesar covered the child with himself. The little girl cried. The parents ran into the room and took the child away. They told the guys to leave the place because the shooter had already killed someone during the day. It was a bad situation, for Caesar had not yet fully recovered. He needed some more rest. Yvon tried to arrange to stay here at least until the snowstorm was over, or until dawn, but he was refused, and they had to pack up and leave. Caesar behaved quietly and calmly in the meantime. As he was leaving the room, he was grabbed by Katya. She was sitting in her mother's arms. The woman immediately began telling him to let go of him. But she wouldn't listen. She turned to him like an angel and thanked him for saving her. He only stroked her on the head and the men left. The weather outside was awful, and Yvonne was worried that they might get shot. But Tsar reassured him by saying that if he were a hundred times a gifted sniper, he never would have been able to hit them in this environment. You could tell they were alive now, thanks to the tagging. The snow was successfully blocking the shooter's view, and it gave the boys time to escape. Besides, the king thought, if the shooter had wanted to kill them, he would have done it at the hotel. But this way he probably wanted to show his toughness, or that he could kill them at any time. 
There were many options, but revenge was one of them. Now they had to try to get away from him. And besides, Caesar's wounds were not yet healed. But the problem was that they didn't know where to go. Vaughn wrapped his arms around Caesar, picked up his suitcase, and helped him walk. For such an eventuality, the lawyer came up with plan earlier, and they went. After a while, they came to a house. It turned out to be Mr. Shishkin's house. They went inside. It was dark. They flicked a switch, and the lights came on. There was still a dead man in the house. It looked scary. Yvonne cleaned the house, boarded up all the windows, and covered the corpse to make it less scary. Caesar was sitting in the corner of the room, and Yvonne came over and started helping him to his feet. It looked like he was training a wild animal. They moved to the second floor, and the lawyer was able to build a fire. The king was surprised at how brave Yvonne was. Even if he were thrown into the desert, he could survive there. The king said he was more like a mobster. But they wondered who wanted Shishkin dead that hired a hitman. Yvonne asked if Cesar knew anything about Leonid, and he said he had outstanding abilities. Tsar didn't often have to cross paths with snipers. The lawyer wondered who benefited most from the death of the witness. The Tsar suggested that we find out even more about Zochtanov, because if he and Berdiev used similar machinations, then there was a witness on Zichtanov's side as well. It was only a guess, but the lawyer liked it. He decided to give it a try. Without realizing it, Yvon became very close to the king, and then as the realization of the situation came to him, he abruptly withdrew from him. The lawyer's hands were shaking, and his heart was pounding. In the morning, when Yvon woke up, he saw Caesar asleep next to him. It was an arrangement, since it was cold at night. He didn't expect them to sleep so far away. Yvon noticed, too, that in his sleep, Caesar looked like Angel. He touched him with his hands, and he mumbled. Then he got up abruptly from the floor went to the corner, and began to embarrass himself by calling himself sick. The lawyer went to prepare a meal. It was later that he began to wake up the king. He said he had prepared the food. They ate in the same place where they slept, since it was cold in the kitchen. Vaughn made breakfast sandwiches. They looked awful, but luckily they were canned goods. Vaughn tried to spoon-feed him, but king said he could eat by himself. At breakfast, they talked. The lawyer was glad that Leonid had left. He had no idea how they would hide from him in such a situation. But one thought troubled Yvonne. He did not understand why he was hired to kill them. The king told him about Leo. He was a traitor among his men. The king continued. Surely he thought that if he touched upon Berdiev, rats would be easy to find. Didn't you want to take his property legally? Asked the lawyer. If it had been a case of simple property acquisition, I would have gotten it to my lawyer. I asked you, an outside lawyer, because I didn't want the information to leak out. The lawyer guessed that it was a plan to expose the traitor. Saar initially had a different goal. All the words about the evidence for the trial were just an empty sound. In fact, he was just looking for the rat. Just as Yvonne thought, Saar could not have come here simply because of him. He was using him to the very end. The king said it was a bargain. He wanted to find the enemy, and the lawyer, the proof. Yvonne ordered the king to stop before he cut out his tongue. He knew he had a different view of the world. It was snowing outside again. Yvonne thought of leaving as soon as possible, but the weather didn't think so. He thought if they split the canned goods and what was on the shelves, the two of them could last about one week. If they ran out of firewood, they could break the furniture. In the end, there shouldn't be a problem. The lawyer was surprised that he could think rationally in such a situation. There was no truth in Caesar's words, namely when he said that he didn't use Yvonne. It was a deal. Next, he began to think about everything Caesar said. Yvonne decided firmly that when they arrived, they would separate. But when they returned, would he be able to treat Caesar as he used to? He didn't know that. But then he heard a strange noise in the room. Caesar was in that room. And Yvonne decided to look in, and he saw a man bandaging his own wound. But the lawyer had only one thing on his mind, to remove himself from a relationship that was already doomed to end soon.
but he couldn't stand it. Yvonne opened the door, took the bandage from him, and said it was the least he could do. When the lawyer began to bandage him, he was surprised at the number of scars on Sar's body. There were old and fresh, even a variety of inflamed wounds. Surely he had treated them himself as well. Without expecting it, the king himself thought that Yvonne would not help him because he thought he was angry with him. Or was it a twisted attempt at murder, he asked. But no matter how brainless the man might have been, Yvonne would not have wiped him out. Then, in silence, he continued to bandage him. The king fell noticeably silent. He said, That wasn't in my plans. He took his hand and said he had put him in danger. He kissed his hand and whispered that it didn't matter anymore. The sound of Ivan's heart pounding echoed throughout the room. Ivan said he wasn't angry with him, because he too had what he wanted from the king. So it was by agreement. So there was no need to apologize to him. The lawyer said they just didn't need to see each other anymore. But after these words, King threw him on the bed. He asked him to repeat his words, adding that he would never forgive him after that. He approached him and, during the trial, an unknown man burst into the house. He heard noise from the room, and as soon as he went in, he saw the czar and the lawyer there. The man's name is Dmitri. He went to him to hug him saying he was glad Caesar was alive. He was talking about his pulse. It dropped to 60 beats per minute. The king slapped him and said that he made too much noise. He said that he had come for nothing, but Dimitri jumped up and said that the helicopter with the doctor was already here. Caesar took him and dragged him outside. He told him that there was a sniper here. Dimitri immediately froze at these words. When he came out, there was a doctor waiting for him outside, and he said that in this cold he should have been warmly dressed, but Tsar was half undressed. He went to the helicopter for an examination. Dmitri said he would take care of the lawyer. The guy greeted Ivan and was delighted to meet them. It turned out that Dmitri was Caesar's cousin. They shook hands, and the lawyer introduced himself. They left the house, and the lawyer wondered how he had found them since they had not contacted anyone. It turned out that Caesar had a microchip in his body, alerting him if he was injured or in trouble. The chip transmitted biological data about his heartbeat and blood pressure, as well as his location to a satellite that he could use to find him even at sea. Meanwhile, they were already approaching the helicopter, and suddenly Dimitri asked a very delicate question. He asked what they were doing in that room. The lawyer said he didn't have to answer him, so it remains a mystery. Dimitri also said that he did not know whether the lawyer would be salvation or perdition for Caesar. But if he got in his way, Dimitri would be willing to kill him with a smile on his face. And the helicopter took off. Lomonosov house. A girl named Natasha came to his house. She, at their first meeting in 20 years, wanted to tell him to leave again. She didn't want him to pry into the man's business. Yvonne and King finally came home. The lawyer could forget his troubles for a while. He flopped down on the bed. He recalls reporting back to Nicholas. It was great for him to see everyone after a long time. But then he remembered that he was holding a note that said, While you were gone, some woman of indeterminate age came by. She told me to get in touch. Below was a phone number. The lawyer immediately picked up the phone and started calling her, thinking it was another client. She was at Lomonosov's house at the time, explaining to him to keep Mikhail out of the boy's life. Mikhail said he understood, and the girl trembled in surprise. But he added, saying that in her case, it was not more reasonable to go and meet him. At the same time, smiling strangely. After the conversation, he got up and left saying he had business to attend to. Since the girl did not pick up the phone, the lawyer thought that the case was not so urgent. But then, he got a call and answered it. It was Caesar, and he said he didn't think Yvonne was the type to run away. But he didn't run away. Yvonne just came home after a while. In any case, they will meet, since the lawyer is going to work tomorrow. He was at Caesar's mansion. The one he wanted wasn't there. Yvonne bought himself a new scooter for this. Assistant King said that he had gone to work, and if the lawyer had a conversation with him, 
he said to wait for him at the appointed time. It seemed to Yvonne that time went on forever. But when he mentioned the king in his mind, his heart began to beat faster and louder. Someone had already entered the office, and Yvonne was nervous, because he thought it was Caesar. But as it turned out, Dimitri entered the office. The lawyer needed to talk to Caesar. And as bad luck would have it, Dimitri always showed up at a good time. As it turned out, my brother also had something to talk to him about. Suddenly, Caesar interrupted the conversation and came into the room. He said he was afraid that Yvonne would not wait for him. He invited the lawyer into the living room. He sat down next to them. They began to talk about the case. The Tsar said that he wanted to look for a new witness for Bertie Ive. But after thinking about it, he decided that there was an easier way. And for that way, they needed a picture of Vasily Shishkin's corpse. Dmitri said that he had already taken pictures just in case. It was decided that the lawyer would go to meet Zdanov tomorrow, and they would come straight after him. Vaughn wanted to clarify exactly what the method was. The king said that tomorrow, he would see everything with his own eyes. Vaughn said he was going to pack for tomorrow, but as he left, Caesar took his hand and told him not to be late tomorrow. Meanwhile, in his office, Zdanov was getting ready to rest. He asked if the preparations were going well. His security guard said it was going well. The man thought that when he returned from the Mediterranean Sea, the trial would surely be over. But then he asked, what was the lawyer's connection to Sergeyev? He planned to deal with him, but his thoughts were interrupted by the guard, who said that he had a visitor. It was Nikolai's lawyer. He ordered him to come in. Ivan came to him. He came because he needed a signature on some papers, and he started taking them out of his briefcase. The man was surprised and glad at the same time because he thought he had decided to give up. He took the paper, read its contents, and crumpled it with his fingers in anger. The paper contained a return of property. If he did not acknowledge this fact and surrender, there would be no future losses for him. The man was furious about this. He took it and tore up the documents. He decided to make his career as a lawyer go down the drain. Suddenly, Tsar entered the office. Zdanov immediately calmed down. He stood right over him, told him to turn himself in. Since he knew that Zdanov was working with Lomonosov, he showed him Shishkin's corpse and said that this awaited those who would work with him. The man was on his knees, begging to be saved, saying he would do anything they said. Ivan was surprised at how effective the king's plan was. The king stepped on his hand and said that he had to sign the documents that he tore up. Finally, he finished by telling him that Ivan was now his lawyer. They turned around and walked out of the office. Already on the street, King handed the lawyer a folder of documents. Ivan was surprised that they got it right. He hugged him and thanked him, then left, saying he would go tell everyone the good news. Already at home, Caesar was met by his brother Dima. On his arrival, he wanted to hug him, but Tsar just walked by. Then Dima invited him to the club, saying that his favorite whiskey had been brought there. Everyone there had already missed him because he had stopped going there, but Caesar came into the room and slammed the door loudly. He didn't want to talk to anyone. Dimitri didn't like it. Already in the room, Caesar threw his tie away in anger. He was disappointed that Ivan refused to go to the restaurant with him. He had reservations for tonight, but usually such tables are booked three months in advance. The king was upset. He thought back to those moments at the lodge. Ivan was partying with Nicholas at his home at the time. Tsar was sitting in his office. He asked the guards if they knew if the lawyer was answering the phone, but the guards said he wasn't answering the phone. The Tsar jumped up abruptly and was about to go to the lawyer's office. Tsar arrived at the lawyer's apartment, and he saw Ivan lying on the bed without his pants on. He was drunk, and there were empty liquor bottles scattered around. He tugged at Ivan, but he didn't even bat an eye. Then he picked him up and carried him away. When the lawyer woke up, the first thing he said was that he had to go to work and that he had a bad headache. He was already quietly awake, and he was surprised that his bed was so soft. He opened his eyes abruptly, and Caesar was standing in front of him. The lawyer turned away from him and said goodnight. 
He didn't understand what Caesar was doing here. Yvonne began to remember what happened yesterday. Yesterday, he drank merrily with everyone else to celebrate the successful resolution of the case. He drank and drank, and then he remembered nothing. It was like he brought a lawyer into his house. Yvonne jumped up and told him to rest tonight, because he drank a lot last night. Caesar, on the other hand, said it was because of the cheap alcohol, and asked how much he drank yesterday. The king pointed him to a pill that was near him, but the lawyer, instead of drinking it down with water, began to bite on it. Only after Caesar's remark, he drank it and felt much better. Ivan went back to bed. He said he wasn't going to work tonight because he had a bad headache. He fell asleep instantly, but then the king decided to wake him up in different ways. When he woke up, he saw that the king was sleeping beside him. He was surprised by this. He didn't know if it was a habit or not, but lately the lawyer had been seeing him asleep. He had the urge to kiss Caesar. Before, his mind would not have come to such a thought. He wondered, if he did, would Caesar wake up? But as he approached, Caesar opened his eyes. The lawyer again said that he would not work today because he had a headache. But at the moment, it hurt less. After what was in the room, they went out to eat. Of the food, there was a high-quality French beefsteak. Then, the lawyer was offered a drink of wine, but he immediately declined. Apparently, he was drunk for the rest of his life yesterday, Caesar said. But Yvonne said a week at the most. It's just that he's tired now, because he's been drinking lately. The king also liked to enjoy alcohol, especially at night. He suggested that the lawyer have a drink with him as soon as he got a chance. Yvonne immediately agreed. Alcohol could be called a lawyer's sidekick. Then they started arguing about who would drink more than who. They continued to argue into the evening. The lawyer said he went back to sleep. It sounds like Yvonne was disturbed by this morning's events. Caesar laughed. He told Yvonne to go to bed and kissed him on the head one last time. Meanwhile, somewhere in the office, someone was very angry that Leonid had attacked Sergei's successor. They planned to teach Lomonosov a lesson, as they were not planning to sit idly by. They learned that the Tsar had let a lawyer into his house. They did not understand what he had in mind. They wanted to summon the king to his office. In the morning, the lawyer woke up in a good mood, as he had a good night's sleep and a hangover. It had been a long time since he had had such peace of mind. The only thing he needed to be happy was freedom from the mafia. But then, out the window, he saw the king drive away, and in a moment, he remembered his words. Today, he was free to go home. The lawyer put on his jacket and ran out into the street, shouting that he was free. Meanwhile, the Tsar was at Tiuchev's office. Caesar was asked why he had not been heard from. There were rumors that the Lomonosovs already had an heir in mind. They had to act quickly. The king calmly replied that he understood what they were going through but that he had personal matters to attend to. They had nothing to do with the organization. Tuchev stood up and shouted, The safety of the heir is the safety of the organization. Don't you think we have no pride? But his colleague asked him to calm down. She asked that they talk things over calmly, without shouting. Since the days of shootings and stabbings were over, the colleague was sure that Tsar had his own hints about the circumstances. She asked for Tsar's thoughts, and he answered, There is no evidence yet that this case was entirely Lomonosov's. Besides, it is not pride that is more important, but the safety of the organization. I will not let you create a problem by making a fuss. Tuchev shouted out and said that no one understood who was now creating unrest within the organization. He turned to the Tsar and said that he had been acting very strangely lately. They had their own lawyer, but the Tsar hired an outside lawyer and a foreigner, too. They closed the subject. The king forbade their attempts at revenge. If they wanted to pull something off, anything behind his back, they would be prepared for the consequences. One of the employees suggested a topic for discussion. It was profit from the territory. They began the discussion. Tuchev was annoyed. Already in the bar, they were talking about Tsar, saying that he was ruining their reputation. 
they had an idea to suspend Tsar. No one had seen Sasha lately. The orders were given by the Tsar, and all the meetings were also held by him. Tyuchev remarked that everyone had a grievance against the Tsar. He asked, What should we do? They could have just reported the whole situation to Sasha, but he didn't trust him. Sasha created the king himself. How many fathers in the world are willing to abandon their own children to their fate? They could just abandon the whole organization, including Tsar, and then just watch it fall apart, and even put their hands on it. Tuchev suggested killing the Tsar. Meanwhile, Yvonne was walking around the museum. He hadn't felt so free in a long time. He thought Caesar would never know where he was. But then someone patted him on the shoulder. The lawyer turned around startled because he thought it was Czar, but it turned out to be a regular guy. He said that Yvonne dropped his ticket. He gave it back and the lawyer thanked him. Even here, he couldn't relax because of these mobsters. Then Yvonne saw a very beautiful picture. It definitely stood out from the other pictures. No matter how many times he looked at it, he was always amazed at the picture. Then a man in an overcoat came up behind him and asked, Or did he like the picture too? The unknown man liked her too. He sometimes comes into the gallery just to look at her. There was a sense of austerity in this painting, but also life. Rubens, that was the artist's name, is the true godfather of the Baroque. If Caravaggio were to take the gloom out of his paintings, only Rubens would remain. They laughed about it. God wondered at this point what the king was doing. The man offered the lawyer a cup of tea to continue their conversation. He immediately agreed, because he had a lot of free time on his hands. The king, meanwhile, came home and asked the butler where Ivan was. He said he was gone. The king was angry. After the cafe, Mr. Peter drove the lawyer to the house. Ivan thanked him. But he said he should have thanked the lawyer for his fun time. He wanted to continue their communication. Ivan left his contacts and added that if he had more time, they could meet. Peter thanked him, and he left. Surprisingly, Yvon was so comfortable with him, as if he had known him all his life. He listened to him so attentively, not saying he was bored or tired. It turned out that the man was Mr. Lomonosov. It was already cold outside, and the guy didn't seem to keep track of time. And he was coming back late. He wasn't quite used to this country yet. The main problem, though, was that he was used to something he shouldn't have been used to. He was talking about Caesar. In the passageway to the house, he saw a familiar silhouette. It was Caesar. It looked like he was angry. Since this was the first time the lawyer had left without warning, he didn't understand why he was so angry this time. He said that King could have just called like the last time. The Tsar said he called. He didn't believe what he said, so he decided to check his phone. There were 68 missed calls from Caesar. And then Yvonne remembered unplugging his phone because he was asked to do so at the museum. But unfortunately, he thought the king just decided not to catch him today. Caesar told him to go inside. Yvonne thought something had happened to him. He said, If there's something I don't know, tell me now. I don't want to find out later. Caesar had already started to say something. But then he abruptly told them to shut it down. And then, again, the lawyer felt this unexpected sense of a chasm between them. Even when he thought they were getting closer, that little gap seemed to keep the relationship from happening. At first, he thought the feeling was inevitable, for they had grown up in completely different worlds. Now, King felt like an unshakable wall that there was no point in even knocking on. It seemed to him that the king wanted him by his side all the time. The lawyer thought that when this case was over, when it happened, they would have no more reason to see each other. The king confirmed his words, for he no longer had anything to bargain with. After these words, the lawyer went home. In the morning, Nicholas came up to him and said it was cool that they were neighbors. And he thanked him for his help. The lawyer said he would find out what he asked for and then tell him. Ivan was already putting on his helmet, and he wanted to go. But a woman came up to him and asked, or it was him. He asked how she knew him and she smiled and said he was Su Yong's son. He invited her back to his house, apologizing in advance for not cleaning up. The girl said that she knew that he was looking for people who knew Su Yong. 
It turned out that she and Suyong knew each other, but Yvonne upset her with the news that she was dead. The girl noticed that he looked more like his father than his mother. And fortunately, this woman knew Yvonne's father. He immediately asked for his contacts and his residential address, but the girl immediately changed her face and asked why he needed to know that. He badly wanted to see his father, but the woman said it was better not to see him. Let him forget the thought. Yvonne was in shock. He said he was mentally prepared for this, whoever he was. He had a message to deliver to his father. The girl said he was dead. Then Lomonosov entered the room and said, isn't it a little early to bury a live one? And so they met again.